so much better. Thank you. All right. Sure. Any other last Any other questions for the good of the order before we start? Seeing none. Okay, let's get going. Oh wait, I see a hand. Yeah, that's me. It's Nathan. Um, oh, it looks like yeah, Caitlin was having trouble getting in, but I th think she got it. Now, oh, so, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Nathan. Yep, I see her here now. Okay, thank you. Who's here at the start? Checking for Indigo. Yep, she's here. And okay, one last reminder, everyone, please mute your mic unless you're speaking. And we will go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, good evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this Thursday, November 12th, meeting of the Tacoma School District Board of Directors. Um, would the general counsel please call the roll? Yes, good evening. President Cobb. Here. Vice President Bonbright. Here. Director Leon. Here. Director Keating. Here. And Director Strozier. Here. I'd also like to call uh, our student representatives, Jasmine Pearson. Here. Nathan Essman. Here. And tonight we're excited to announce two alternate student representatives that are joining us. Caitlin Yee. Here. Hi, Caitlin. What, uh, which school do you represent? I go to Stadium. Welcome, Caitlin. And Indigo Hill. Here. Hello. Hello, Indigo. Where do you attend? I go to Wilson High School. Great. Welcome to all of our student representatives and our new student representative alternates. We have a quorum. Thank you. And I just want to welcome you all. This is a great, exciting time. Things have felt very different since we had to leave school face-to-face -face last spring as a result of COVID, and we haven't been able to resume any meetings face-to-face, -face, but for some reason, having you all here tonight feels very energizing. So welcome to all of our new student board members, and absolutely welcome to our new board member, Director Strozier, who will have some time on the agenda in just a few minutes. Um, item number three, adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? I so move. Is there a second? I second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion adopted. So item four, we will move on to oath of office of our new board member. And just for the record, um, this Director Strozier was called in via the roll call because he was officially sworn in tonight, but we want to swear him in publicly to this evening. I believe he is joined by his mother um, and we're great to have, glad to have you. So I'll pass it to Director Trueblood to say a little bit more if there needs to be more, I mean, sorry, General Counsel Trueblood to say a bit more if there needs to be more said. Otherwise, I'll let you all take it away. No, thank you. Uh, we did swear in um, Director Strozier on the 5th, so he is already acting as our uh, official board member for seat number three. Um, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Strozier and his mother, I believe, who is Go ahead. We can't hear you though. You're muted if you're talking. Sorry. I'm that? so sorry. <laughs> we officially swore in uh, Director no, Strozier. You heard the beginning of you, Renee. I think you just got muted right at the very end as you passed it to Mr. Strozier. So sorry about that. Fast, fast fingers tonight. So we'll we'll pass it to Director Strozier and his mother for the ceremonial swearing in. Thank you. All right, here we go. All right. So I, Corey Strozier. I, Corey Strozier. Do hereby solemnly swear. Do hereby solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Washington. And the Constitution of the State of Washington. And will faithfully discharge the duties of. And will faithfully discharge the duties of. Director of Tacoma School District Number 10. Director of Tacoma School District Number 10. Pierce County. Pierce County. State of Washington to the best of my ability. In the state of Washington to the best of my ability. Thanks. 
Awesome. Oh, welcome. Well, um, if you were in person, like we'd be cheering and all these things. So welcome. And do you or your mom, I mean, family, whoever's with you, do you want to say a few words before we move on? It's again, welcome. We're glad to have you. We feel complete again. But do you have any words that you want to share? Don't mean to put you on the spot, but I want to give you the time. No, it's all good. Uh, my mom said uh, no, because she's going to tear up. So that leaves it to me. And uh, again, I'm just extremely excited to be a part of this. Uh, I'm ready to contribute to the great work that's being done. And I can't wait to connect with each one of the board members so that we can ensure that we're working together and make things happen for the students in Tacoma. So thank you. Great. We're all glad to have you. Um, I won't, don't want to skip over this moment too quickly. So I'll just pause and ask if any other board members have any comments before we move on. I can call on you if you want, but you can also, Director Bond, right? Well, um, Director Strozier, welcome. As the um, most recent addition to this, uh, to the appointment process, I went through this last year and I, I just can't tell you how thrilled I am to have you on the team and looking forward to working with you and your energy has already um, uplifted the group. So thank you and um, hold on to your hat because it's gonna be fun. Any others? Director Keating, Director Leon, feel free to jump in if you have anything to share. Sure, Dr. Director Scherzer. Very excited to have your, you to join us and bring your background, your experience um, professionally, and you know, as someone who's been a student here in the district before and uh, in this uh, in Tacoma. So I think you're going to have just so many valuable things to bring to our students and, and our staff. So thanks. <laughs> I just want to echo everything that's already been said. I'm thrilled to have you on the board and thank you for applying. Um, and the job, I mean, in our conversation during your interview, um, I think the board members talked maybe as long as you did, um, just in terms of like answering questions. Um, this role is way different than um, I think a lot of us understand it to be before we get involved. So. Um, anything that I can do uh, to help support you in being successful, I'm 100% in. So welcome. Great. Okay. And again, before this moment fully passes, I just want to loop back to the beginning and thank those other individuals who applied and who we had an opportunity to interview for this position. We couldn't have asked for a stronger pool, and I'm just grateful for um, all of you, if you might be listening, your willingness to serve. So looking forward again to serving with you, Director Strozier, but I want to acknowledge and thank all those who express an interest in the role too. Okay, moving on to item number five, members of the public wishing to address the school board. Um, note for the public, we have an alternate protocol. Um, school board members encourage public participation. Your civil input is appreciated. If you'd like to address the school board during a virtual meeting, um, held under the proclamation by the governor, amending proclamation 2005-20-28, Open Public Meeting Act and Public Records Act, you have two options. I won't read the two options in detail, but for the public, they are listed and included on our agenda and are noticed on the district's website. We have two options for you, generally one where you can submit comment live during the board meeting. You just need to reach out to the school board secretary and we can give you information about how to do that. And a second option where you can submit your comments in writing. In both cases, we need your prior, um, prior notice from you that you'd like your comments to either be attached to the board agenda or to be included in the live meeting. But please, if you're interested in offering public comment at the meeting, we welcome it and appreciate it and just reach out to us and we can show you how to do that. Moving on to item number six, recognition of staff, students, and community, 6.1, recognition of public records manager, elected president for the Puget Sound chapter of ARMA for the 2020-2021 school year. And just as a note for the public, any acronyms that you see in these agenda items are typically spelled out in full in the substance. Um, the substantive materials for this item. So note that you will see some acronyms in the high level reference to the agenda items, but those are spelled out in the documentation. So I'll turn it over to General Counsel Trueblood. Thank you very much. And, you know, um, there aren't a lot of awards out there for people who work in public records. 
Um, I think there's often even not an understanding of everything that goes into public records. And we just wanted to take this moment to recognize our public records manager and also devoted historian, Joey Grant. Um, I'm so proud to have Joey on our team. She's been with the district since uh, 2017 and came to us with a great wealth of experience in both public records as she worked with the Pierce County Health Department, um, but also in uh, with a master's in library science and a master's in public government, or uh, um, in um, um, MPA, a master's of public administration. And to have somebody with this much talent who is on our team is really a gift. Um, people, I think, sometimes underestimate the importance of public records. Even the Dalai Lama said, transparency result, a lack of transparency results in distrust and a deep sense of insecurity. And what Joey brings to the job every day is a commitment to transparency, a commitment to helping the public get the information that they need about what's going on in the school district, to doing it in a friendly and kind way, to helping to educate other um, records custodians at our schools and even in the community about best practices in records management. And I'm really proud of the work she's done over the last year of working with the Tacoma Historical Society as well and helping to preserve our records for future generations. Um, we are really honored that the, um, that the local chapter of the American Records Management Association, which is an international association, has elected Joey as their local chapter president, which is really a huge honor and really reflects on um, who she is and what she does for us. And so I wanted to just take this moment to say thank you to her. She is a critical member of our team. I'm so honored that she's been um, recognized by her peers. And um, another great thing about Joey is in the law, there's oftentimes this standard of the reasonable, per reasonable person. What would a reasonable person do? Somebody who's thoughtful and fair and kind and smart. And when I have that question, one of the first people I go to is Joey. And I say, Joey, what would a reasonable person think? So she's one of my trusted advisors as well. I just want to give her a chance to come on the screen um, and say a few words. Thank you, Joey. Thanks, Renee. Um, that and you got to turn on, turn on your uh, camera and, and make sure you're unmuted. So we get you up here. Am I there? Can you hear me? Yep. I hear I can you. hear you, but I can't see you. Oh, we can see her. I can see her, Renee. You can see her? OK. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, We might Renee. have to. Very kind. Um, I have a strange passion for records. So um, I'm very happy to be here at Tacoma Public Schools. Um, you guys have allowed me to blossom in my career. And I feel that uh, the support that Renee has given me has enabled me to move forward and to do stuff with um, the professional organization, ARMA, that I do because she allows me to have that time to be able to do that. So thank you, Renee. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joey. And I mean, like Renee kind of alluded to, we know that that's important work and we need like skilled people to do it. So we appreciate your commitment to the profession and to that level of transparency that we all want and kind of strive for. So thank you and congratulations. Item 6.2, recognition of 11 Tacoma Public Schools that have been named recipients of the Washington School Recognition Program for the 2018-2019 school year. Uh, thank you, good evening, President Cobb and members of the board. This is Dan Volpel, Executive Director of Communications. And it's my pleasure tonight to honor a number of our schools, our school leaders and staff teams for their hard work and dedication that has led to statewide recognition in the Washington School Recognition Awards. I wanna note for you that although these awards are bestowed in 2020, the organizations presenting the awards uh, base the honors on data from the 2018-2019 school year. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. Now, just for the edification of our viewers, viewers, I'd like to recap for you a little bit of important background on these awards. Up until three years ago, these statewide awards were based on overall student achievement and typically went to schools with low poverty rates across the state. 
And the awards did not account for whether those schools had any growth in student achievement. So the three organizations there on your screen took an awards hiatus and totally remade the, the system. Next slide, please, Tom. They used a greater depth of analysis to highlight schools that closed gaps in a wide range of categories and demographic groups. They looked at schools that made growth in subcategories of students, such as English language learners, um, and they looked at English language arts and math categories. And in the case of high schools, what they did is looked at achievement across multiple categories. So what you'll see tonight at our schools who have outperformed other schools, uh, they're doing so in these more relevant and meaningful categories. So let's take a look at our 2020 award winners. Next slide, please, Tom. Our first winner is Crescent Heights Elementary School. Crescent Heights won for growth for students identifying as white. And just a note that the school's demographic breakdown is 44% white. Congratulations to Principal Cassandra Stefani and the entire staff team. Next slide, please, Tom. Fern Hill Elementary School is a winner for closing gaps for one or more student groups at a targeted school. Now, targeted schools were originally identified in this new program due to low scores in certain subgroups of students. So Fern Hill is a high poverty school with more than 70% of its students receiving free or reduced price meals, and more than 18% of the students are English language learners. So congratulations to Principal Scott Monson and the outstanding teaching team and staff at Fern Hill. Next slide, please, Tom. So the Fresh Start is a Tacoma Community College program where high school students from Tacoma and surrounding districts can enroll to complete all of their high school requirements. Now, while it's not our program per se, it's a partner program and viewers will find it listed under Tacoma Public Schools in the official State Board of Education honorees, and that's because TCC falls within the Tacoma Public Schools boundaries. So I wanted to note for you that Fresh Start's program uh, succeeded at growth with students who are English language learners. Next slide, please, Tom. So next up is Geiger Montessori. Principal Neil O'Brien and the team of teachers, paraeducators, and other staff who collaborate at Geiger are recognized specifically for growth among students identifying as Asian and white. And those two groups make up about 65% of the total Geiger popula population. So congratulations to Geiger. Next slide, please, Tom. Larchmont Elementary School won honors for growth among students identifying as white. Uh, this student group makes up about 22% of the entire student population at Larchmont. Congratulations to Principal Melissa Thenis and the staff team at Larchmont. Next slide, please, Tom. Northeast Tacoma Elementary School made the list for the second year. Uh, the staff team there got together and really dug into the student data and made targeted uh, improvements. The school earned what turned out to be one of the two most distinguished of all of our elementary schools and among the highest of the elementary schools across the state. As you can see on the slide, they have high growth among multiple student categories, including English language learners, low income students, students identifying as black and, and students identifying as white. And that tells you good things are happening there across the board. Uh, the staff team is under the current leadership of Christiana Devenuti and deserves congratulations. And I also wanted to make sure a note for the board members and those watching at home that Josh Zarling was principal at Northeast Tacoma for several years, including the year of data collection for this particular honor. So a big shout out to Josh, who is now the principal at Mason Middle School. Next slide, please, Tom. Point Defiance Elementary School earned honors for growth among students who identify with two or more races. That student uh, group makes up more than 15% of the whole school population. Congratulations to Principal John Aiken and the staff team at Point Defiance. Next slide, please, Tom. Reed Elementary School earned honors for growth among students identifying as white. At Reed, this student group makes up just over 15% of the entire student population. Congratulations to Principal Abby Sloan and the staff team at Reed. Next slide, please, Tom. The Science and Math Institute, notably, is our 
uh, only high school to receive recognition this year with high achievement across multiple metrics, including English language arts scores, graduation rate, ninth grade students on track to graduate, and students earning dual credit. This is a significant honor. Congratulations to co-directors and Tanishi and Elizabeth Minx and the innovative staff team at SAMI. Next slide, please, Tom. Skyline Elementary School is the second of our most honored elementary schools this year with notable growth among students who are English language learners, students who receive special education services and students identifying as white. Congratulations to Principal Regina Lake and the entire dedicated staff team at Skyline. Next slide, please, Tom. Last but certainly not least, Stanley Elementary School won, rec won two recognition honors. First, for students identifying with two or more races and students who receive special education services. As the board members already know, more than a quarter of all students at Stanley receive special education services. In addition, one quarter of students identify as two or more races. Stanley uh, has received multiple academic honors in recent years, so a big shout out to Principal Julie Hecox and the staff team at Stanley. So thank you, President Cobb and members of the board for this opportunity to highlight the excellent work of some of our schools, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dan, and congratulations to all the schools who are recognized. Um, from firsthand experience, I was working at OSPI when the State Board, OSPI, and the EOGOAC, the Education Opportunity Gap Oversight and Accountability Committee, decided to relook at this recognition system. And I remember it pretty clearly because I just, I think it was maybe my second year on the board when the prior recognition ceremony took place and the only one school in Tacoma, I believe, maybe there are two, but I remember Lowell pretty quick, clearly was like one of our only schools that was recognized out of the couple of hundreds of schools that were recognized across the state. So I think the, the transition in that program to consider and recognize growth and recognize performance among different student groups is a significant step in the right direction to getting more um, recognition for the work of different schools across the state. So congratulations to all of our schools who've been recognized and we just keep moving forward and hopefully more will show up for an even more diverse set of accomplishments. So thank you, Dan. Um, moving on to number seven, uh, I'm number seven, the superintendent's report, 7.1 COVID-19 updates. So I've asked Dr. Garcia to give our um, COVID-19 um, COVID report today. So, um, Josh. Thank you, Superintendent Santorno. Uh, Joan, can we bring up the slide deck, please? Next slide, please. Oh, one back. So just uh, some starting off with, <laughs> we'll start with the one that has Pierce County updates, please, gentlemen. I uh, want to give you a, a kind of a global picture to start with our county. As a county, we remain well over the 75 per 100K uh, and remain over 75 uh, in our 14 day count COVID-19 cases. So what does that mean is that we continue to remain in the high category. As many community members know that we are, uh, Pierce County is averaging well over 100 per day. Um, I didn't see today's numbers, but we, we're well over 100 uh, case rates per 100,000. So the high category means that we can still serve students in the highest needs in small groups or cohorts. And that distinction between groups and cohorts is that it's really a semantics. We're talking about small groups of kids that are cohorted together. Uh, we currently have small groups of students on campuses throughout the Tacoma Public Schools. And then all other students and families will remain in remote learning until further notice. And so families uh, need to continue to uh, plan for uh, to operate in remote learning. Otherwise, they are in uh, been notified that they are in a small group. Next slide, please. Uh, give you an update on enrollment around Tacoma Online continues to remain uh, steady. Uh, give you an, uh, this week I looked at the numbers. We had 
3,896 students. So uh, we've remained right around 3,900 students, um, which is pretty consistent. Um, average daily attendance amongst all schools is 89.76. Enrollment across the district, as I've shared with you in the past, uh, is still down. Uh, various factors are contributing to that, um, and we'll be able to give you an enrollment update here in the next uh, board meeting or two. Internet access to continues to be a challenge for some families. Uh, FFTS is the foundation for Tacoma students. They're our community partner that are processing internet support families. Um, I apologize, this isn't the most up-to-date um, slide deck. So um, they have approximately 900 requests out there, but they have served, uh, I think I want to say close to seven or 800 families, the latest numbers that I got today. And so I'll get you those at a future update or in a board report. Um, but uh, this was our latest update and they just gave us one again today. So the a number out there of total requests that are still waiting to be served and there's various reasons why that is, is down to 900. And I want to say that they've served over six to 700 families already. Uh, families and students should continue to be monitoring their grades through Schoology. Um, we've talked about that in the past, but it's really important that families as well as students are in Schoology looking at their students' grades and then contacting their teachers if they need support or if there are questions. We started our, uh, every year uh, in the fall, we start grade calls for folks that, uh, students that have fallen below a C, and those started this last week. We waited a little longer this year to get started, um, but uh, they have been activated. So families, if you're new to high school and you got one of those call, that means your student has one or more classes that is below a C um, and that we need you to reach out to the teachers to help us uh, build a plan. We wanted to like, give you an update. Uh, we've distributed over 21,000 computers. Uh, K2 still order, the order is still on the waiting. Um, some folks may have heard the governor make some announcements that the ESDs have computers for school districts that are not to the 101s. We have contacted our ESD and we are waiting to hear more from there. Um, we continue to look for uh, various opportunities almost on a daily basis, but once again, the supply chain is the, uh, what's really holding folks up. And so we haven't been able to secure any more computers. Um, but we're currently targeting, that date has not changed uh, January to have K2 students get computers. Next slide, please. Uh, a lot of folks have asked this, and we just wanted to publicly acknowledge, uh, how will the elections impact COVID-19? Um, and we don't know yet, uh, but it is natural with any election process, no matter uh, state, local, federal, uh, that there will be some changes uh, in there. And so this, this statement is not about uh, anything other than a recognition that we recognize that we just went through a major election process, but we don't know how that will impact our COVID response from everything from uh, technology services to uh, testing kits. Uh, we know that we anticipate that there's more coming information as that, as that unfolds. We served over 220,000 meals in the month of October. Uh, we continue to uh, Average both September and October have been seeing those kind of numbers. Uh, that is a little bit down from the spring, but it is still a significant number of meals being served on a regular basis. Um, free and reduced lunch applications are critical to our future and we continue to accept applications and we want folks to know that. Um, and if they have any questions, they can access the website or they can call their school or, or even our uh, the, the central office administration. We can help them with that uh, application. Uh, we know that there are still spots available in our community partner day camps, so families are still looking for childcare, and we, we want to keep on reminding folks because we know um, uh, the conditions for our families are ever changing. And so just this may be a new information to some families that are looking that there are still spots available in the community partner day camps. And you can access that through our website, Metro Parks website, or once again, if uh, internet is a challenge, you can definitely call us and we will we will. Uh, help you uh, access that that partnership. Uh, last week, or I guess it's almost two weeks now, our first uh, ELO digital pilots launched um, in our Wallace uh, grant funded schools. And so that was an exciting opportunity. And we have kids that are doing extended learning opportunities through our schools and our community partners now um, after school programming ends. 
Metro Parks has launched their youth sports opportunities, uh, some exciting opportunities in partnership with uh, the parks, YMCA and the Boys and Girls Clubs and Tacoma Public Schools. So folks, ask, well, what does that look like? Well, that's virtual training and uh, some support programs, everything from cross country and some other sports. And so it doesn't look like your traditional sports season, but there is opportunities to get out there and get physical uh, and work on your, your good mental health by staying active. Our partnership with Metro Parks to serve McKinney stu Vento students. Uh, we're currently serving about 95 McKinney Vento students in a very targeted partnership where um, McKinney Vento students are able to go into community sites and get extra supports. We continue to examine the possibilities of high school and middle school sports in alignment with the WIA recommendations. So the WIA is, is once again going through a process. So we don't know when sports will start. Um, but we do, uh, it is on our, one of our top priorities is as soon as we're able to engage our kids, both middle schools and high schools in sports and athletics and activities, we want to do that when it's safe. Um, and right now, unfortunately, the county numbers, as I shared with you, don't make that possible. And this is for everyone. Um, if you're going into a community program or if you're coming onto a campus, even for a distribution of materials, if you're not feeling well, please stay home please mask up. Uh, we can make alternative arrangements for you to get that information or access that. And so um, we also want to know that, yes, events are planned uh, and we will continue to monitor the, uh, the statistics of the county. And if we need to reschedule an event, even if it's the day before, we will do so. Uh, but we're going to continue to plan activities and events where we uh, it's accordance with the state decision tree. Um, and then with that flexibility that if something changes or if the case rates are too high, then we can always uh, reschedule at a later time. And I believe that's it. Next slide, Tom. And I would imagine that uh, the superintendent and myself are available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I want to open it up for questions or comments. I'll start with um, Vice President Bonbright. You're muted. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Deputy Superintendent and, and Superintendent. That was a very thorough presentation, and um, I, I was um, you know, concerned. And I think I mentioned to you before I was concerned about the number of families that are still awaiting connectivity. Um, and um, it's, it, I think everyone's a little frustrated since uh, since the resources should be should be available and there's lots of reasons why people aren't connecting, but uh, we're, we're, we're waiting and we're working on that. And I think so, thanks for that. Um, I, I also, um, I, guess, I guess that's it. I think, I think you were pretty clear about all the other pieces and I don't have any, anything else to add. Director Keating, any questions or comments? Um, I would just um, add that um, to the case numbers today, we're 245. Um, so they're uh, definitely not going in the right direction, um, which is really concerning. So um, other than that, thank you for the presentation. I don't have any other questions. Director Leon. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's just. I'll just uh, highlight, I mean, some of the things you've already mentioned, but I think it's important to see that uh, the students and families are participating, their attendance, that attendance, daily attendance rate is in the you know 89% range. We all know that not everybody is tuned in 100% of the time, every single moment that they're logged in, but it's still a good number that uh, shows that families uh, and kids are trying their best. Uh, we know that it's, uh, it's really hard. Um, learn this way and stare at a screen for such a long period of time. Um, but we know that you're learning and your families are learning. So uh, we know that the computers are still not here for the youngest ones and they're hopefully will be here at the um, um, maybe December. We're not uh, sure when they'll come in exactly, but that's a, a rough timeline I think that we've had before. Uh, so we understand there's frustration from some families with younger learners and I empathize with, um, with them, we all do. Um, if we, we can, um, we've heard about the infection rates obviously being on the uptrend, um, not just a trend, they're definitely up. So just importance of um, physically and socially distancing ourselves, especially around the holiday times, um, is going to be important. Um, and, you know, we've heard from community members, we've heard about the sports um, question, 
we there's probably not a safe way to open up um, official high school middle school sports we're grateful that metro parks is giving an avenue for this because it's not just about um somebody working on their you know college scholarship and needing to practice their sport it's not that the most important part about sports is this emotional and social emotional piece of uh, belonging getting some um, stress out uh, seeing friends uh, all those type of things really help the mental health of a, a lot of people so hopefully people are finding a way to do that individually um, and then metro parks will be a partner to help us with uh, any formal safe way to do some sports so we're um, we feel for all those folks out there that can't get together uh, to do that because um, along with uh, you know we haven't even mentioned music and choir and all the other arts that are unable to happen so they're all such important ways to help with our mental health so thank you i want to loop back to director keating really quickly i see your hand up and then to um director I mean, Dr. Garcia, and then I'll go to you, um, Director Strozier, with any questions or comments. I just forgot, thank you, um, President Cobb. I just forgot to mention, um, I know that in these virtual spaces, um, it's really challenging to stay connected. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Wilson's staff, um, that they, some of the staff have been sending um, postcards to students. Uh, my daughter got two from two different teachers today, and um, it was a really, it meant a lot to her and just to be recognized and feel like there was that um, ex, um, increased intention of, of staying connected. So I just wanted to, I know it's just really hard to just stay connected when we're um, living so isolated. So I just want to acknowledge the um, extra effort. And I know that Wilson is far not the only school doing this, not the only staff doing this at all. I just, it's one example. Um, and I'm, I would love to see other examples of ways that staff are staying connected with students as well. But um, I just wanna say that it's really appreciated. Dr. Garcia. Yeah, and uh, Director Keating and I are right on the same wave. Like I was just going to say, I'd be remiss to, to thank all of our uh, school teachers. They're doing a phenomenal job. I see some lessons in Schoology. Uh, Superintendent and myself have been in several different classrooms. Um, Mount Tahoma is another example. Director Keating, they just acknowledged some kids for uh, perfect attendance. Go T-Birds. And it just the list goes on. So I just wanted to publicly thank our, our classroom teachers, our, our educators, our principals, our janitorial, our ESSAs, all these folks are just rolling up their sleeves. And so, yes, it's difficult to stay on the screen all that time. But I, I tell you, there is just one numerous example after another of creativity, fun ways for P classes that are, you know, in great, incorporating uh, technology and name it. And it's not the same. And I know our students would uh, articulate that, but it's uh, our classroom uh, folks and our school folks are, are, are leaning in hard. And so big shout out and thank you to them. Thank you. Director Strozier, any questions? Real quick, thanks. For, yeah, real quick, thank you. Uh, I, I did want to kind of piggyback a little bit on what Director Leon was saying about uh, the need for the tech technology. I was, uh, I want to shout out to the Foundation for Tacoma Students because what they are doing in reaching out to families who are in need of internet service is actually open up, open up doors for folks to share what they really need. I was a part of those first round of calls for folks who needed um, internet service. And we also found that um, it's not just internet that we needed or the internet that they provided was not fast enough to serve the four children in the house. Like you can only really connect one student at a time. So while well, I was glad to see that number drop from a thousand to 900, it's a lot more work to do, but they are really rolling their sleeves up and doing it. So I just wanted to shout out to uh, FFTS. Thank you. Um, I do want to hear any, uh, I'll give you a chance to think um, to our student board members, especially Jasmine and Nathan, if you have any comments about just school reopening and how things are going, any thoughts to share, please feel free to share those. But just before that, I do have a couple of questions, Dr. Garcia, about your last slide in particular. Um, one, on the Schoology and checking grades on Schoology. For students who are enrolled in Tacoma Online, um, should they too be looking at Schoology for grade information or should they fully rely on what's provided through the Edgenuity platform for grade check? 
Yeah, so that's an amazing and a very thoughtful question. So uh, to come online, students should be going through edgenuity. And and why folks would also say, so what's the difference between the two and why do we have two differences? So remember, you know, COVID has been ever changing. Uh, and so um, edgenuity is the platform that allows for the curriculum for the uh, to be accessed in the 24 seven fashion. Um, and a lot of those classes are done and stored into that platform. Um, that was the original plan in there. So their their school records uh, is a combination of what's in eSchool Plus or the hack system and Edgenuity. So they are both learning management systems, but they are run in parallel. All other students should be looking in Schoology. And why we keep on reminding folks of that is because it is new. And so we want to make sure families still understand that, yes, you can go check in those progress. You can still see uh, how your students are doing and we want you to engage and help us support there so they are two learning management platforms and if you're not in Tacoma online you should be looking at Schoology and I'll try to do a better job of reminding folks and if you are in Tacoma online that is through Edgenuity. Thank you for that clarification and just I mean when we started the school year I think probably most of us thought that we would absolutely be in hybrid mode by now and like moving into full on um, face-to-face -face maybe in January but it doesn't look like that like likely to me, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but the point that you just made, Dr. Garcia, about the differences, I think reinforcing again, as we move into the later part of the year, what the differences are in terms of what it could mean to families, I think might be important. I think that there are some families in some situations where that asynchronous um, opportunity of Tacoma Online might be beneficial just given work schedules and where kids need to be and when some of that so I don't know if there's a, actually anything more than that that comes to mind as a key difference but as families think about needing more flexibility or on the, on the reverse their student needing more interaction with other students and with the teachers that they're familiar with I think highlighting some of these differences as we continue to be engaging with both of these platforms ongoing might be a good thing for us to keep in mind so thank you for that um, my other question was about, um, oh no, um, we already spoke to that. It was more of a comment. Your last slide made me think of a couple um, things. Um, the reference to the free and reduced price lunch applications. In this time when everything is different, I think some of these things that just go without explanation need more explanation. I know we've talked about this in prior meetings, but because the public it, and members of the public are generally not school finance experts. The significance of knowing whether or not a family is eligible for free or reduced price lunch is m about more than just making sure they get access to food. That is like key and primary, and that's the main mechanism in typical times that we know that you're eligible for a free or reduced price meal. But in addition to that, unfortunately, the state and many federal programs too have relied on that information to decide how much additional funding to give schools. So it's very important for us to, I think, communicate clearly to the public that there are some pieces of information about you and your family, your situation that may be difficult to share or that you don't necessarily want to share and just don't feel like it's the school or any institution's business. And we totally understand that. But I just think it's important for us to be explicit about the fact that when we talk about our district being whatever percentage free and reduced price lunch eligible, that's not a number that we get told to, that gets told to us. That's a number and a percentage that we come up with because of what you tell us. And then we use that information to report to OSPI, and they give us additional funding to provide greater supports to our schools and to our students. So just want you to know that we take that information that you give us seriously, and it does have implications about the level of resources and supports that we're able to provide to our students in turn. So I just want that to be clear. In addition to that, like similarly, the information, the reference to McKinney-Vento students that was in your last slide, that too is not a designation that we know unless families tell us. So if you are a family and you and your family are experiencing homelessness or in that situation, it's, again, not necessarily information that you want the school to know or you want to be um, recorded anywhere, but please know that the federal McKinney-Vento program, along with some other state programs, do um, create a different level of um, 
expectation about how we try to support you and your students. So know that in this time too, like having that information and knowing provides us the opportunity to kind of marshal some different re additional resources that otherwise aren't available unless you tell us. So um, I know that again, transparency, communication, relationships all really matter right now, but just know that we take that information, um, we treat it seriously, we treat um, your privacy um, with the highest respect and know that when you share with us, sometimes there's some additional resources that we can bring to bear to support you. Dr. Garcia. Yeah, I just want to reemphasize that that subtlety that you mentioned with your last sentence is that, that these resources come back to serve students in these programs. It's not that they just go into the, the general fund per se in there. So when we're collecting this information and when that, those numbers there, it's so that we're able to provide additional supports and services to students in the McKinney-Vento or they may come in a Title I school, which is a federal designation. And so um, the, the resources are really critical um, to help support those that need them the most. Thank you. Um, um, student board members, um, I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't know if I see any hands, but related to school reopening, do you have any questions or comments? To start with Jasmine, if you don't have any comment, that's fine. I just wanted to give you an opportunity on this topic. Yeah, uh, I mean, first and foremost, I just want to thank all my teachers, like, for supporting all of us. I know that this wouldn't really work without them. Um, and it's, it's been interesting because students, like, obviously all learn differently. And so some students are having a really hard time with it, um, me included. But then some students are, like, excelling. They love this, like, way of learning. So it's been interesting to see. Um, but there has been, like, a lot of mental drain on students, I think. Just there's no separation between, like, school and home. And then if you have extracurriculars... They're typically online too. So all of your stressors are at home. And so it's been really difficult to like compartmentalize all of the things that you have to do, still make time for yourself and still make time to be with your family. Um, and a lot of times, even in class, it's hard to stay focused, especially when there are connectivity problems. Cause sometimes with the teachers, they cut out. So you have to spend 15 minutes trying to be like, oh wait, we didn't hear that last part. Um, or other students have problems, they're getting kicked out of class with no real reason. So it's been interesting, but I think that, you know, we're learning and we're adjusting. Um, and again, just like, thank you to all the teachers, especially speaking as a senior. Uh, I know that like my teachers are really taking time to help us through, you know, our post high plans and helping us apply to colleges and, you know, helping us write our personal essays and take the time to write letters of rec. And I just want to say, like, I can't speak for all students, obviously, but like, we we see you and we appreciate you. Thank you. Nathan, do you have any comments? Don't mean to, again, put you on the yeah. spot. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Um, I I echo what uh, Jasmine said. I, I'd like to thank all my teachers because I think they're doing a, a pretty good job for, you know, what's uh, what the situation is. and. Well, things are probably moving a little bit slower than they would in a normal year, um, which is like the biggest problem, I guess, I see with it. Uh, you know, like we're not getting lessons as fast and which is, uh, it's okay, but, and maybe that's good for some students too, uh, who are having trouble struggling, you know, with the online format. But overall, I think it's it's working as well as it can. And I think that's a that's a good thing. And like Jasmine said, too, we're all learning um, along the way, and uh, it's getting better every day, I think, which is good. Great. And Caitlin and Indigo, I know you're our alternate, so, and we won't have you all here all the time, but on this topic in particular, I want to give you a chance to weigh in, too, if you have thoughts. Indigo, are you going to say something? Thank you. Yes, I'd like to chime in. Um, I work, I help as an assistant at a daycare. So I work with the younger kids while they're doing their online school. And I've noticed personally, it's been uh, a little bit more hard, uh, more difficult for them to kind of hone in and focus, especially if they have like a, like a learning disorder or something or deficiency. But, um, you know, having someone there is really important and it's really hard for parents to be able to be there for their children, especially if they're working and everything's, um, you know, remote. So I think with this year being the first year we've had to, we've come across something like this, it's definitely a trial and error period. So it's 
it's great. I love that you're taking the input from different students and just considering, you know, the whole child and all families. So we're definitely working, you know, as best we can, especially at the daycare, but it's, it's been difficult, but they're, they're still picking up some concepts that they normally would if they weren't online. Caitlin, any comments? Um, yeah, similar to what Jasmine and Nathan said, like, I really appreciate the teachers for being more understanding with like due dates and stuff. But I think a lot of students are still kind of struggling with like all the different platforms because Stadium kind of transferred to Schoology a little late. I don't know about other schools. So we're still like learning and it's just hard to like upload your assignments because it takes so many steps. So I think a lot of students are kind of discouraged by that. Thank you. Doctor, I see Dr. Garcia and Superintendent Santoro nodding and listening. So thank you very much for highlighting some of these things. Um, and we will all just keep learning and keep getting better. So appreciate the feedback and the comments. Okay. Any other Superintendent Santoro, Dr. Garcia, any last words? Okay. We'll move on then to item number 6.2. Wait, sorry, I'm taking it backwards. Item 7.2, upcoming construction updates. Thank you. So I think we're going to start with uh, um, Mr. Uh, Aldridge, Morris Aldridge, and he's going to talk to us and give us a little bit of a construction update, Morris. And I think he's going to talk, uh, we have a bond slide in there too, so get a little bit of a bond update. Morris, you're muted. Sorry about that. I think Rosalind has someone that's going to speak to the bond slides, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Kristen's here. Okay. Uh, no, I'm here. Oh, Rosalind's here, sorry. Kristen's here tomorrow. Rosalind's here today. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> and if they uh, bring up our presentation, thank you. I believe I'm the first slide. So I'm happy to, to share with you. So if you'll recall back, uh, we've brought to you a number of times some updates in the last few months around uh, the potential bond sale. And just to kind of revisit in history, back in October of last year, uh, this board of directors approved us to go out and seek a bond on the ballot in February. And um, that support was really welcomed. The community embraced that support or that request and they approved our vote at um, a little over 68%. You can go to that first slide. Tom. Thanks, there you go. Um, and, and so in that resolution, it also included the requirement for us to um, have at least 25 years, not to exceed 25 years of maturity on our bonds. So we did our bond sale on October 21st. We sold all $535 million of bonds and we did it over two series, a series B and a series C. If you recall back in July, we did um, a redemption of our previous bonds and, and did a refinancing, so to speak, on those bonds. And so that was our series A. They're in order of how we've sought debt for this year. So the beer, the Series B tax exempt bonds, uh, those are bonds that we will get better tax rates on uh, for those bonds that we sold in the short term. And the taxable series, we got better tax rates or better rates on those for the long term. And so we used a, a we, we went through some very calculated scenarios of the different opportunities that we could potentially uh, offer to investors. And we settled on these two series that I think brought us some really good results. We went out in the market on the 21st, we closed on November 2nd, and it was a really rough week in the market when we went out. The, um, the volume of sales was around $20 billion. And we had said that we wanted to get in before the uh, market maybe started to have a little bit more disruption and volatility around the time of the election. And in doing that, so did everybody else in the country. So it was a huge week in the market when we were out. Uh, and the amazing thing for us is our bonds sold really, really well. Uh, they have something called overselling, which is basically where people come in and say, well, we want to buy these bonds. And then other people come in and say, well, we want to buy them too. And we were oversold almost three times in all of our bonds which means that we were able to go back and seek um, discounts from the people who were willing to invest. And we were able to get even better rates than we may have had if we hadn't had such great credit and such a great um, 
a great opportunity for investment in our in our bonds. If you'll flip over to the next slide for us. Uh, I think that we were fortunate to go out the week we did in saying that because the following week, if you recall right before the election, there was some pretty serious disruption in the, the market and we would not have been better served if we had waited. Uh, this is just a quick summary and I am not gonna go in detail, um, but there's two highlights here that I think are important. For that $535 million series of issuances, we got an interest rate altogether of 2.68%. So when you think about that in terms of your own personal mortgage, and it's very similar from that respect, except that it's a thousand times bigger than what your personal mortgage might look like, um, we're only gonna pay 550, or excuse me, $759 million. And I say only, I know that's a lot of money. Please hear me in the right, the right context. But um, you know, we had initially anticipated that we might pay closer to $900 million to borrow these resources. And we will only end up having to pay $760 million to borrow those resources. And I say in, in that there's a caveat to that, we did not do anything that would prevent us from refinancing these bonds in the future if interest rates were to go even lower than where they have been, although they are at a historic low. Uh, I think that that is still a potential opportunity for the future, so in, it's likely that when these bonds mature, um, which we'll be able to refinance in about 10 years, that we would be able to potentially turn those back in and, and, and get some better interest rates for the future. So it's a very exciting time. And I thank you for the opportunity and congratulations to the board for pushing through this, this request for us to be able to go out and make such uh, an amazing deal and putting the, the needs of our students and their buildings and the safety of our kids and staff first. Thank you, Rosalyn. Morris? So if we can go to the next, the next. What we wanted to try and do tonight with the selling of the bonds was to be able to kind of remind our board and our community of where we're at with the 2020 bond pro programs that we're going to, that we currently have started and what we'll be doing in 2021. Uh, next slide, please. The first is the replacement of Downing Elementary School. And just to remind the board, that replacement school is going to be incorporated with uh, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, the building right there that shares, shares that property with us. Uh, we believe we can save roughly $5 million in doing so. And it gives us a, a great partnership opportunity there with the Boys and Girls Club as we move forward with this. Um, as you can see, the, the timeline for that will start in April 2021 with the construction itself, which will start, of course, with the teardown of Downing, uh, and then we expect to occupy that building in 2022. Now, we will also be coming back to the board here fairly shortly with an agreement with a purchase agreement for that Boys and Girls Club building uh, so that we can move forward with that. And I think we talked about it a little in the past, uh, but it's going to, again, give us an opportunity to uh, save some dollars there, and the Boys and Girls Club, along with a, that campus, is actually going to be sharing that, that same building. Next slide, please. Uh, Skyline is the other building that we're currently working on, design that we're working with there. Uh, on that, again, one of the things I failed to mention uh, on Downing is that we do have a district advisory committee, uh, I'm sorry, design advisory committee that helps in all of our projects. And that design advisory committee is made up of community members and folks and parents that live in that area, along with an executive committee that we also have. And that executive committee is made up of the principal, some teachers, uh, a counselor, and some other folks there on campus looking at those educational components to make sure that we're meeting all the programming needs uh, on those campuses. And of course, as we develop these two, both these campuses, we're looking at safety and security and making sure that those are always paramount along with our teaching and learning that, that's occurring in the classrooms. Again, this building is also slated to open in 2022. Next slide, please. The next one that, that will be coming up and actually we'll be going to the state's um, project review committee in order to get permission to go design build will be Fawcett Elementary School. Uh, Fawcett design then would start in 2021. We would come to the board uh, once we've uh, selected a team to be able to start designing that project. Fawcett will swing to um, McKinley for two years once they go over there and we expect them, we, we believe that they will be ready to open then in 2023. Uh, and of course, 
and we've got bathroom upgrades. Actually, this building comes down, so this is not this is not an upgrade. So we need to update this slide, um, and we'll also have the community involved in the design of that building as well. Next slide. Also occurring starting in January, again because of the sell new bonds or all of our. Uh, safety and security upgrades. We're working with our safety, our safety and security department as we look at making sure that we're getting all the needs input into these buildings. We believe that we can do at least 10 to 15 campuses at a time because part of what we want to make sure we do is manage these pro projects properly. You get too many things going at one time and things slip through the cracks. But as you can see, uh, as, as, as we look at this, we're looking at the entrance controls again, upgrading all of our security cameras, uh, card readers, and intercom systems on all of our campuses. Next slide. Uh, and then we start looking at things that benefit the community because, we, again, we do have so many partnerships uh, but both with the Boys and Girls Club, the Y, uh, with Metro Parks and with Tacoma Creates, we're making sure that those projects are also ongoing as well. So the next slide, please. Uh, and this is a list of kind of the fields and some of those things that we actually have a lot of partnership opportunities with. We hope to start the design of these projects in January as well to give us an opportunity so that we've got those spaces outdoors. Um, obviously, we wouldn't start doing any work on those in January during the rainy weather, but if we start our design in January, then by the time the dry season rolls around, we should be able to get the majority of these projects up and going so that we can have them ready um, for 2022 as well. Next slide. Now, one, there was one thing I do want to mention before we, before we get into questions, one of the things that our board did in 2016 was looking at our um, community inclusion. And one of the things that we want to make sure that everyone understands in all of our projects is that we are working toward those community inclusion goals. We've been able to meet those goals as we've done with our design build projects. The only area that has been difficult for us to get to, to, get to has been the women owned business side. But I can tell you that we're working with not only with our construction partners, but with the city of Tacoma identifying uh, companies that we can put on our projects. And one of the things that it allows us as we're moving forward in 20 with these new dollars and with these, some of these smaller projects is that those projects will be all local small business projects. So when we're looking at boilers and looking at some of these things, all of that work will come either into Tacoma or Pierce County because we've got more than enough expertise within uh, our, our, our area to be able to do that. Any questions? Thank you, Morris, and thanks, Rosalind, too. I'll start with um, Vice President Bonbright. Any questions or comments for Morris or Ms. Medina? Um, no, thank you. I appreciate the very thorough presentation by both, and I have no questions. Thank you. And Director Keating? I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Director Leon? Any questions or comments, Director Leon? I'm going to take that as a no, unless I hear from you. And Director Strozier? Again, real quick, I, I think that as, uh, it's always uh, encouraging to see the investments into, into the buildings that we uh, occupy and our students occupy. That's great. Um, I was a staff member in, I, think, I can't remember what school I was in, when we started to look at the security updates and the, the interests with the keypads and all that. And more of a comment, I, I would hope that there is a way to while, yes, can uh, continue to have security at the forefront of our operations, to look less um, prison-like, if you will. Um, I know that that was one of the huge concerns when I was at uh, one of our high schools. I, I won't mention it, but parents often complained a lot about it. It's like, why does it feel so, so much like a jail? I can't get in to get my kids. Um, so I would just have, like, maybe keep that in the forefront. I don't, that's out of my wheelhouse. And I know that, you know, structurally things have to look a certain way. But I did want to bring that forefront because I saw that picture and it reminded me. Thank you, though. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. And, like, um, for um, just something that we used to talk a lot about is, like, making schools secure but not hardening them. So I appreciate you bringing that up, um, Director Strozier. I have just two questions. One for Ms. Medina. Um, 
with regard to the um, securing an even lower interest rate than we had planned, does that mean that our annual debt service payments will be less than we had budgeted and will taxpayers see any noticeable benefit or what does that mean in the end? So I'm still waiting for our final um, debt schedule so that I can plug it in and see where everything's going to lie. Um, we try to keep a level tax rate for the first few years, and then it will likely decline after that. So, but I don't have the formal numbers to say whether or not, you know, how, how it will necessarily impact us over the next couple of years. But okay. we did see a considerable increase in our assessed value, which means that tax rates will go down. But you as an individual homeowner, just depending on how your home value has changed, will see potentially an increase or a decrease based on, you know, the value of your own home. Okay, thank you. And then for Mr. Aldridge, just one question about the purchase of the Boys and Girls Club building. Will they then become a tenant of ours moving forward or how will the purchase of that building impact the relationship between us and them? Yes, they will kind of become a tenant of us. Currently, you know, that, that building actually sits on district property. So they own the building and we own the land. Uh, what what we're doing right now, working through legal, is coming up with an agreement that works for them because all the dollars that we use to purchase that building will go toward a fund to actually support our middle school student programs that we have that that are currently occurring there. So yes, they will be a tenant, um, but it, it there's again we're trying to work out the details of that agreement now so that we can bring that to the board to be able to to look at. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Director Keating's hand. Director Keating. Yeah, I just had a follow up question to that around the property for where the Boys and Girls Club is and where Candle Park, where the um, like, where is where's the property division between those? If you're familiar with where, well, where the police substation is located, mm -hmm. if you look east and west there along that line, all the parking lot that's on the candle on the Candle Park. I, I can't think of the name of the park again. Candle yeah, that's right, Candle Park. Candle Park. Everything on that side of the line belongs to Metro Parks, and we have everything then on the north side of that line. Okay. All right. But, Thank you, but we, will be, we will be working with Metro Parks to also look at sharing uh, part of the parking lot as well. Okay. Thanks, Morris. You're welcome. Thank you. Any further comments from members of the board? I want to give Dr. Leon one more chance to jump in if you had comments. I'm not sure if you, you heard me call before, but... I didn't because I was having technical difficulties. Now I'm back on my computer, so thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Rosalind Medina, for saving us all that money and when we decided to make the sale. So thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Aldridge, thank you for your leadership in getting the planning, proper planning for these schools. So uh, nothing else to add. I think it's really important uh, that the community sees their dollars going, going to good work. Thanks. Thank you. Just as a last comment on this, I just think it's so many times now, having served on this board, there's so many instances where we share the line with Metro Parks and THA and everybody, every, these property lines on these public spaces are just really interesting. So it's great that we all get along <laughs> because we share these fake boundaries. It's like a piece of grass that separates us. So I'm glad that we're partnering in this way and figuring out how to make things work for all parties to still be able to do their best work because it's really seamless for a community. Like you don't know where the line ends and you go into the Boys and Girls Club, you're at the school, you're at Candle Park. So thank you for your commitment to like working with these other entities in this way. Any other comments? Seeing none, we will move on. Thank you. Item number eight, consent agenda. And just for the public's um, um, reminder, the consent agenda has a lot of items on it. We don't go through each one of them. They're standard items that we approve and act on every meeting, including approval of prior meeting agendas, the personnel report, and standard things. So just know that we see these agendas in advance and have an opportunity to raise questions, but we do take action on all these items all at once. So um, item eight, again, consent agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda? I motion to adopt. Is there a second? I'll second. Been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments about items on the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item nine, policy matters, and there are no policy matters tonight. 
Item 10, 10.1, year-end financial report for the 2019-2020 um, budget year. Thank you. I'll give Tom just a moment to pull up my presentation that I would like to share with you this evening. So as part of our board policy, it is our requirement to come to you at the end of the year and provide you in November with an update on where we ended last year. So that's what this evening is meant to provide you with. If you'll go to that first slide for me, please. Our first slide is the general fund only. And I think it's important to spend just a couple of minutes here explaining what this slide represents and um, highlighting for you just a couple of, of items. So what you'll notice in the first row is the beginning fund balance and you'll see what we budgeted to what we actually received. That is how we ended the prior year. That's what 1819 looked like when we ended 1819. And we were $6.7 million, roughly more than what we had budgeted for when we started that year. And, you know, 1819 was an interesting year. We ended up getting a little bit more in revenue than we planned for. And so we ended up having a little bit more left over at the end of the year. Uh, it's also important to note that when we budget for the beginning fund balance, that's happening a full 18 months in advance of when that like comes to fruition. So there's always a, a relatively large number of offset there. We're, we're not that great at predicting 18 months out, but I'll tell you what we are good at. We're good at predicting our revenues. So if you'll go to that next row of revenues in the 1920, I'm sorry, not the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the revenues that we had were $472.8 million is what we budgeted. And our actual year end came in at 470.8 million. So we were down about $2 million. However, from our budget, we were at 99.6% correct. So that's great news. We came really close to our estimate. We were slightly under the forecast. We can take in as many revenues as we would like. Uh, there's no limit on the number of dollars that we can receive as a district. And I think it's important to note that that number also includes some CARES money. We did have some revenue losses in a number of programs like the food services um, or even in our apportionment, we were having some, some offset based on some CARES, or excuse me, based on some COVID issues. And so uh, that's represented there as well uh, than, than whatever CARES money we claimed for the 1920 year is included there, which I think was around $3 million, maybe just a little bit less. Uh, that next row is our expenditures. And so we budgeted $482 million roughly, and we ended up spending $474 million roughly. So we saved $8 million in the expenditures that we had planned. Now the expenditures, when you adopt the expenditures at the beginning of the year, that um, initial budget amount, which would have been 482 million, that's the cap that we can spend. We cannot go over that amount without coming back and, and getting approval from you in advance to spending that overage. Uh, we didn't have that circumstance this year. Uh, and so we actually saved a little bit. Some of that was uh, COVID offset. We didn't have as many um, extracurricular activities. We didn't do the sports like we normally do. Uh, we had some savings in supplies and materials across the system. And so those helped to offset some of the expenditures that we were having for COVID. Uh, and, and so we ended up in a relatively good position on, an, on the expenditure side of things. Uh, then I'm going to draw you down to our ending fund balance. So we'd only planned on ending the year with $24 million. We are actually ending the year closer to $37 million. That's a big swing, and it sounds like a lot of money. Uh, but what I do want to tell you is uh, that what we're seeing with our enrollment currently, and there was a note that went out to the board of directors in the Friday report this last week, is that our enrollment is down quite a bit. We have lost about a thousand students roughly from a financial perspective, and that's approximately $10 million just in, in enrollment losses, uh, let alone any other potential program offsets that we may see either through revenue. So transportation might be one. We're not actually transporting students. It's based on ridership. We don't know what our apportionment will look like based on that. So uh, in the situation where we don't find other savings or offsets in the system, uh, just the enrollment alone will eat up a good portion of that fund balance because we do still have many of the expenditures in place. Uh, we 85% of our budget is in salaries and we have not made significant reductions since the beginning of the year, although we are holding off on a number of um, hiring and uh, extracurricular activities that we may not have. 
we could still very much see a significant decline in, in our revenues based on that. So uh, take it all with a grain of salt. It's good news. It's great that we have this extra resource. It puts us in a little bit of a better position than we thought we might be in. And so that feels a little more comfortable, but I don't think that means that we're out of the woods yet. At the same time, it doesn't mean it's time to panic. And so we're trying to take this one day at a time and uh, be proactive, but uh, react accordingly when the requirement is there. And then I just want to say on the fund balance, this equates the 37 million is about 7.8% of fund balance. Our required reserves, as you know, as per your policy is 5%. And then Tom, if you'll go to that next slide for me. And just a quick update, uh, while that 5% is there, we use that for emergencies. Uh, we have an expectation from our bond rating agencies that we're going to hold a certain amount of resources uh, for any kind of emergencies or other extraordinary events. Uh, at this point, we're looking at we have about, I think, 35 days of cash on hand. So in the circumstance where no additional revenues were coming in and there was a, a broad scale emergency beyond just the long term emergency we're in now, that we would only have about 35 days of operations. We'd be able to make two or three payrolls, and then we would have to start borrowing resources in order to fund uh, our ongoing activities or make significant adjustments to those. So we try to maintain our internal cash uh, at somewhere around that five to 8%. Uh, additionally, we also have flexible cash throughout the year. Um, our, our resources from the state don't come in evenly each month. We get different percentage in different months. And then as well, our tax receipts don't come in uh, the same amount in every month. And, and so we're working to ensure that we have enough resources to help float us through any kind of the, the lower months of cash coming in. On that next slide, this is just a graphic of our revenues versus our expenditures, very typical. Um, what you'll see in the dark green bar are our revenues, and in this year, our revenues did uh, fall short of our expenditures by $3 million. So even though we ended up saving way more than we anticipated, I know that's a real technical term, way more than we anticipated, uh, we still ended up expending beyond the revenues that were coming in. So that's not something that we want to have as our standard. Um, we did intend to do that. We had budgeted to use about nine million dollars of fund balance, so we're not um, we're not as bad off as we could have been if we had spent to the plan. Um, but just know that we, you know, it's always our goal to try to keep our revenues and expenditures pretty close to to one another. And this only represents about a half of a percentage of overspend. And then, Tom, if you go to that last slide for me, please. This is just an, uh, an uh, overview of how the other funds that we operate have ended. Uh, we have the Associated Student Body, which is held um, in trust for our students for, for um, activities and extracurricular work that happens. Uh, their ending fund balance is $1.98 million. Our debt service, which is used to pay for our bonds and um, any kind of interest on our bonds has left us at uh, $13.7 million. Uh, that balance will help offset next year's required reserves. So um, we'll, we'll be working to bring that fund balance down in the debt service and collect fewer taxes from people. So it'll help us keep our tax rates level if assessed value happens to go awry. And then our capital projects, we ended our fund balance with $64 million roughly. Uh, that's where we account for all of our small capital projects and the buildings that Morris is working on building for us. And finally, our transportation vehicle funds, which is where we buy our yellow buses. We have 2.6 million remaining in there. And we try to spend about $700,000 a year. But I know we have a couple of big years coming on our replacement schedule where we'll need to buy more than the standard six years or six buses that we would have been, we've been, we have been purchasing over the last several years. So that was the update I would like to provide for you this evening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Medina. And I'll go. Ahead, I'll start with um, Vice President Bonbright with questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Rosalyn, for a, um, a you know thorough uh, presentation. On that last slide, it went away fast, but um, there was a huge gap in the capital funds um, from you know what we what we had to begin with was where we ended up. Is that because we were spending down the last um, the money from the the last bond election, and it, it really hasn't done, doesn't have anything to do with the 535 million that we're about to come in? So so we were spending down money that's been. I, I just want to make sure that I understand that. 
That's right. And and so with the bonds that we just sold, let's just take that as an example. So with the bonds we just sold, that $535 million, that money will now go into the fund balance of the capital projects fund. And so while we only ended with 63, we're going to start this next year with, you know, $600 million. And, and then we'll start decrementing that from there as we start to, to build out all of the different projects and pay off all of the contractors for that. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought, but thank you for clarifying. Excellent. That's it. Director Keating, any questions or comments? Um, I have one comment and then two questions. So on the WASDA call today, and you probably know this already, Rosalind, but the um, OSPI budget request, had um, has a hold harmless on transportation. So it definitely is a priority and something that I know is being um, heavily advocated for to help um, maintain um, transportation funding for districts. Um, and then, so I was curious if um, thinking about the cost of COVID and the expenses due to COVID, do we know, is there um, a figure of what the um, cost of COVID has um, is not has but is and then i know that there were um um we were there's a lot of lag in terms of getting um re reimbursements from um the previous school year so i was just curious like is there um and maybe this is something to bring um to us later but i would just be curious to know what covid has actually cost us thus far sure and and you know courtney's on if you want to add anything courtney please feel free but i would just say um, and and we intend to bring you some information in december to the board so uh, i don't want to make it too premature to jump the gun but we've been we've been trying to keep our covid expenses separate those things that are clearly covid related and you know specifically identified and then there's, you know, all these other weird inherent costs where, you know, like we lose revenue in food service and we, you know, have these like weird little impacts that we've been trying to track and keep a, a finger on, um, but they don't always just come to us and say, hey, I'm a COVID expense. So I think that uh, we've, we've been working really hard to, to keep track because we want to do our CARES claiming as quickly as possible. We're really trying to get as much claimed before the end of this year. Uh, these grants from Pierce County have been amazing and they're wonderful, but they also have a time deadline of December. And so we've been trying to use those up first too. And so um, we, we've we developed some plans of what we're going to put into that COVID grant. And I think Courtney can offer you know, some really great information either now or in December. I think that's great. A great question though. I can add, um, hi, I'm Courtney Leach, Grants Manager for the District. It's, thank you for the opportunity to answer that question. It's a tough one to an answer. Um, we, have, um, we have direct costs that have come in, um, things that we can point at and say, gosh, that's really from COVID. Um, and that's looking at about 7 million right now. Those are costs that we can really clearly point at and say, yes, COVID, very unusual um, and, and um, we can uh, attach to one of our funding streams. We also have things that we are, are purchasing, you know, that uh, ahead of schedule, like or that we didn't plan on, um, like laptops, um, things that we, you know, we have um, budgeted for, but we're doing it ahead of schedule. Or we have teachers deployed doing things that they didn't do before. Um, so I can say that um, as someone who's looking for COVID costs, um, we're using our existing resources really, really well. Um, and so finding those exact costs is quite, um, is difficult. They're there, they're everywhere. Um, isolating them is a challenge. So I have a follow-up question to that. Thank you very much, Courtney. Um, in terms of the grants, um, Rosalind, you mentioned that the grants for Pierce County, for example, are ending in December. What happens in January, like for some of this funding that we've been relying on? We're using most of those grant fundings to cover things we've already paid for. So we're not using them to buy staff or using them for ongoing purchases. Uh, they're usually one time, and we've got plenty of them, one time purchases or, you know, um, maybe like Schoology as an example, we had to pay additional resources for Schoology and we have a contract that we have to pay for. And so, you know, that's easily identified and it, it fits into the grant. And so we'll just sweep that on over to the grant. So I think that there's really no cliff that we're gonna fall off of, so to speak, in January as it relates to the funding that we're no longer going to be receiving. They're one-time dollars. We have one-time expenses. We're matching them up and we're being done with them. 
Thank you. Yeah. Director Leon, any comments or questions? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, you commented on the thousand less students that we have. Do you foresee uh, that number going up or we stabilize? Is this how many how many students we expect to lose for the year? Probably no way to know for sure. Uh, that'd be one question. Answer that, and I'll have one more. Too. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the the enrollment is always a tricky thing for us. So we we generally report October enrollment as like our our dipstick benchmark number for the first time we um, take. First time we take an enrollment count in October is the one that counts for a lot of things. Um, however, we also then have the ability to go back and adjust October all throughout the year. So I, it's, it's beyond me to understand. It's not my role um, in the organization to monitor and track it, but I believe that it happens. And I know I, I don't know why it happens, but sometimes even in like July and June, we're still making adjustments back to October. And it's just the circumstances become more known or there's been a certain, you know, for some reason. So we can see that October number change all through the year. And that's not untypical, atypical. So uh, I think that there's still circumstances that we know of that after our October enrollment count was submitted, that we made adjustments to the system. And so we're anticipating, I really don't know if it's going to go up or down. I just know that there will be a change. And in the end, it could be, you know, a handful of students, or it could be a hundred, 100, 200, 300 students. Um, I just, I won't know for another couple of weeks. But I think it's a great question because we do have an annualized enrollment that that's what counts towards our um, apportionment FTE. And they take each month's count and add it together in a formula. And that's how we end up getting our apportionment. And so it does make a difference. You know, if, if November goes up or November goes down, if December goes up or December goes down, that has an impact on the funding that we'll receive. So we will be tracking that very carefully this year because of that. I don't know if I answered your question directly. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's a it's a hard and it's a hard uh, question to answer. With the, definitively, I see that. So, I think it's good for the community to know. Um, uh, how are we doing with um, getting our free and reduced lunch kids, or, you know, families signed up? Do we feel like we have uh, places where we can make improvements on that? And if so, we okay. Is that is that something that's happening? I think I will ask Mr. Williams if he's. Um, available to answer that. Uh, I know that they've been tracking it and we've had some conversation around it. Or if Dr. Garcia might want to take that one. Sorry, I was on mute. I apologize. Thank you. So okay, there, there you go. There are three avenues in which we're, um, parents are able to apply. One is obviously you can do it online or, or two uh, within the school. And three, you can cert, uh, certify by the state whether a parent loses a job or uh, applies directly with the state. So there's three different avenues in which parents can apply. Yes. Also, can I just add also, um, the individual schools are really making an effort also. So if families are struggling or coming in and talking about struggling, you know, a lot of our families are new, you know, new to struggling. And so um, sometimes our staff has to invite them to apply and, you know, and it's uh, that they're not always eager to do so. But we're trying to let them know um, exactly what Dr. Garcia talked about earlier is that it helps with funding for, uh, Director Cobb said it, is that it helps with funding many other things. So I know that each um, each school building is really working to try to get uh, students signed up also, families signed up. And Director Leon, I think you're asking also the, how are the results? And so the, the results, so those are the efforts, the results are significantly down, thousands of applications comparatively to the years past. Okay. Thank you. That makes my eyes bug out of my head. I just think of the learning assistance program funding formula and you take the percentage of students and the number of students enrolled in a district to percent eligible for free and reduced price lunch. And that is like the driver of your funding for a lap. So there's a big, I mean, there's more to it, but that's a big chunk of it. So I'm going to call it like, I just, it's very important. I'll stop and freaking out my mind. We important. all have to remember we're not the only ones in this situation as well. Yeah, and this is a issue. state and national issue um, across the nation. And so 
you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, it's going to have to be an ongoing conversation. Um, and, you know, for families, it, it's, you know, they're doing their best and they're, they're trying to survive. And, and it, um, so we're just going to keep on working it uh, to all those great efforts that the superintendent and Mr. Williams mentioned and uh, understand that we're not alone in this. Um, we know this will be a legislative conversation, <laughs> both at the state and federal level. Uh, and um, it's probably not going to be resolved anytime soon. Um, I just have, uh, oh, Mr. Strozier, do you have questions? I'm going to go to you. Okay, nope. I have one question. I know that it's um, just related to expenses that are somewhat COVID related, but not necessarily one time. Like you mentioned earlier that we have purchased a large number of laptops, maybe that we didn't plan on purchasing when we purchased them and probably more than we intended to purchase. It's kind of in this forced into a one-to-one -one program. At what point in time do you think you all will start to have some estimates about what it will cost ongoing to maintain these machines and to potentially refurbish or re re up the, like what what what's your sense of when we'll know what the ongoing costs are going to be to maintain these machines? So we have a tech levy, and this was originally built in a part of the tech levy. Uh, the ratio, as you mentioned, it was definitely accelerated, so there'll be implications. So I think uh, we can give you a tech levy update uh, in the springtime. Uh, okay. We're going to have to come up with a strategy. We're not going to be able to replace all the computers at one time. And so sometimes we'll probably be in a cycle where we're buying computers before they're needing to go out because you can't wait till they all go out as well. And so... Uh, uh, Mr. Grassi has done an amazing job in helping working with Mrs. Medina to, to A, get us to this place uh, where this is even a possibility, and then B, is this, he has a plan that to, to start to roll out. To, so how will we start to um, buy the replacement computers? Uh, they've even planned for insurance for when they break and things along those lines, battery life. So we can bring you that in an update maybe right after the calendar year. Okay, that's great. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Any last comments from anyone on the board? Okay, thank you, Ms. Medina. Appreciate the update. Thanks. Okay, moving on to item number 11, curriculum instruction. There are no curriculum instruction matters tonight. Oh, wait, there are, sorry. 11.1, um, CTE district-wide annual report and Carl Perkins, uh, Carl Perkins grant. Um, John Page is going yeah. to help us with that. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening, Superintendent Santoro and President Cobb and members of the board and Dr. Garcia. Uh, thanks for this gift of time to share a little bit about our CTE programs. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint uh, prepared if Tom is uh, ready to put that up. Let's see if I got the right camera on here. So... Thank you, Tom. Um, so hey, I wanted to call your attention that November is uh, National Apprenticeship Month uh, across the United States. And uh, I want to call your attention to the photograph here. On your right is Stephen Guterro. He is the first registered youth apprentice uh, to journey out in the history of Washington State. Uh, despite COVID, um, he journeyed out last week. He started his sophomore year. Uh, he graduated last year from Mount Tillamah High School and, and he journeyed out into full-time employment with Titus Will Ford. You see over on the side, two people behind uh, the scenes, uh, Shannon Sam is the service manager, Titus Will Ford. Jeff Klenke is our registered apprenticeship coordinator for Tacoma Public Schools. So this is a huge celebration uh, for, for all of Tacoma. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, wanted to share a little bit about our alignment with CTE and uh, the district-wide plan, uh, our strategic plan goals. So we certainly align with academic excellence, partnerships, and safety. Uh, the benchmarks that we really focus on in CTE is life after high school, which really comprised of industry-recognized credentials, verified acceptance to the next institution, and then CTE dual credit, where students earn college credit while enrolled in their high school classes. Next slide, please. Um, for the annual uh, CT approval tonight, um, these materials have been uh, reviewed and uh, recommended for your approval by our CTE General Advisory Committee, which is composed of business leaders and community leaders uh, of Tacoma. So there's really three parts to the PowerPoint tonight. The, the Carl Perkins Five Grant application, uh, which also includes a comprehensive local needs assessment, 
which is the federal reporting uh, guideline, and then the uh, career and technical education district-wide plan, which is a requirement of OSPI. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the Carl Perkins grant, uh, what I'd uh, like for you to know is that it is uh, administered by the uh, United States Department of Education. CTE is a federally uh, recognized program. And as you were talking about funding streams uh, earlier tonight, um, part of the funding stream here uh, it's it's a non-competitive grant it is based on the k-12 demographics as you were talking about the uh, free and reduced price uh, mill program certainly goes into the calculation our allocation this year for tacoma public schools is two hundred seventy one thousand one hundred eighty five dollars and that's about one and a half percent of our total cte budget um, the nice thing about carl perkins grant uh, funding is it is discretionary um, we support a lot of different programs for students. Um, three of the big ones are innovative certification programs, the comprehensive career guidance, and then student leadership programs. Next slide. Um, the comprehensive local needs assessment, last year was the first time that we ran that. That was a requirement across the state. Um, there's five components. Um, it's really about what we've been doing in Tacoma, uh, what you as a board of directors have been working on for at least uh, 11 years now, and that is closing achievement gaps with our um, strategic plan. So really the five components are improving equity and access uh, of our students to access the programs, then evaluate student performance, evaluation of our, our whole comprehensive CTE program, implementing our programs of study so kids have plans in place for where they're, what they're going to do next after high school, and then the recruitment, retention, and training professional development of our CT educators. Those are the five big components of the, the CLNA. Uh, next slide, please. In our district-wide plan, there's really, across the state, there's 16 key components. I picked a, a handful of those 16 that are really ones that we, we focus on all 16, but these have been directly related to our strategic plan. That would be the industry-recognized credentials, the in-demand pathways of healthcare careers, environmental services, uh, skilled technical trades, and computer science education. We continue to expand those programs. Um, the expanded learning opportunities are after school programs and the summer innovative programs that you've heard about uh, through our different uh, media. Um, professional development, technology upgrades, which we aligned with tech services of the district, our CT advisory committees. Now, over the years, we've always included equity as an embedded component of the 16 uh, different criteria. Uh, this year, our general advisory committee um, decided to call it out on its own. We created for Tacoma a 17th uh, criteria equity with a primary focus on professional development. Uh, next slide. Some of the big projects that we're working on this year I thought it, uh, you'd want to be aware of is the CTE dual credit for high rigor classes. That's where our classes are aligned to college credits. So kids are earning college credit at no cost to the families. Uh, we, we really put together a a much more comprehensive database. Probably at about 95% of our CT classes at the high school level are now articulated for college credit. Um, CT classes at middle school level by state law are, are not eligible for college credit. Uh, our team this year, we're just about there on the high school and beyond plan. And uh, we're built, building our own high school and beyond plan um, to customize it that it'll also fit in with the district's uh, data warehouse project with uh, uh, Director Zeke Edmonds team with the uh, data assessment research team so we could run more accurate reports of our kids and how they're doing with their high school beyond plan. And then uh, utilizing the CLNA, uh, that the actual data from the assessment um, to grow the cultures to go on the CTE. When we put the CLNA survey out to our community, uh, we had approximately 100 to 105 responses from 13 different uh, categories. Um, it, it include, for example, uh, tribal representation, uh, post-secondary educators, post-secondary administration, school counseling, business leaders. So it's really a diverse group from uh, the Tacoma populace. Uh, next slide. I wanted to call this, I'm going to show you two slides here, but let's stay on this one. As you know, uh, uh, Director Leon serves as the CTE liaison to the board. And uh, last year, uh, when, when I had the privilege of presenting on the CTE uh, program, um, Director Leon had asked a question about what does the representation of the different uh, uh, race classes look like in CTE? Are, are they representative of our overall population? And I wasn't able to put that, uh, you know, that data up that night, but it, that has stuck with me. It's been a part of our general advisory committee uh, conversations each, each meeting. 
But uh, what you see at the top of the slide, I just looked at our grades nine through 12. I did not include uh, middle school data in this data set, but currently this, this data was pulled last week. Um, we have a head count of 8,657 kids in Tacoma in grades nine through 12. So that's a little over uh, 2,100 kids per, per grade level, okay? This would be head count, this is not duplication, but you can see before you, here's the breakdown of our race uh, uh, groups uh, by our high school population, 14.9% uh, African-American, 1.12% American Indian, 10.09% Asian, 20.55% Hispanic, 3.08% Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, and 11.88% uh, other multiracial, and 38.38% uh, that identify as white. So I want you to take a look at that slide. I apologize, I, I probably could have put both these slides in one, one slide in hindsight. Um, but what we were looking for in our CT advisory group, is there any dis disparities or is there any big gaps? Like who has access to CTE? You know, what are the quality of the programs? Um, how are kids finding their way in the, it, it just leads to a lot more conversation. So this is our population of current ninth through 12th graders. If you would so, uh, show us the next slide, please. Um, okay, so then if we take that population of high school students, um, as of today, how many are taking one or more CT classes? So up at the top of the slide, you'll see that 2,695 students um, at the high school level are taking one or more classes. There are several kids that have two classes and several kids that have three. So this is unrepeated. This is simple head count. Um, so what you see is there's... Uh, the data shows that, uh, so African-American is 16.36, uh, American Indian 1.04 enrolled in CT classes, Asian 7.53, Hispanic 22.75, Native uh, Hawaiian Pacific Islander 3.04, other multi-race 12.02, and then uh, white 37.25. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to take a quick peek at that and kind of hold those numbers there, and then we'll go back to the, the next slide. But um, what you'll see is that the representation in CTE for African Americans is about it's about 1.5 percent uh, uh, difference. Um, Hispanic is about two and a half percent, and in Asians uh, it's probably about two and a half three percent. There's not a big uh, a gap that would say that one group is oh, way overrepresented um, of another group um, based on uh, the populations enrolled in our entire high school program. High school scheduling is driven by student interest, by their career interest. It's different than uh, scheduling for core classes, although CTE does meet graduation requirements. It meets, um, as, as we talked about earlier on the uh, dual credit college, there's lots of different things it can meet. But for the most part, uh, CT classes are self-selected by students, okay? So I'm gonna ask you to, if you would, Tom, to go back one slide, whoops. And just so you, uh, you can see the number, they're pretty darn, uh, pretty close um, for the population that we're serving. Um, so I wanted to get back to you on that. Of course, it leads to the next questions that our, our general advisor would be asking. So tell us, you know, how are those kids doing? The different groups of students, how are they doing in their CT classes academically? And uh, so that's what we do in our CT advisory is uh, look at the students that we're charged with serving. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, Comprehensive, uh, so the D D DWP is a district-wide plan. We do put our resources of the Perkins Grant in the Comprehensive Career Guidance. Um, the High School and Beyond plan, uh, for years, uh, we used um, career cruising as our platform. Uh, we found that at where we are now with data in Tacoma Public Schools, it wasn't meeting our needs. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we decided to build our own. Um, it's been quite a journey. Uh, we, we're building it in uh, Schoology as our electronic uh, platform. You'll see that the, the first five components of the um, High School Beyond Plan are set by OSPI. It's a graduation requirement for high school students in public schools across Washington State. So there's a, there's a piece about identification of career goals that, that includes a career interest survey. What's, what's neat about what we built for Tacoma, what we're building right now, is kids have options. They don't have to take all one survey. They can take a variety of surveys to triangulate their information. And as they prepare their for classes, coursework for what they might select as a career to, um, to set a course on. Um, the identification of educational goals, so it's, it's asking the student really, students are you know, curious learners. It's asking students um, to explore all their options 
when you think about goals, it's, uh, you know, what do you think you might want to do? Uh, military service, apprenticeship? Are you thinking about going to college uh, two years after high school or for four years or advanced degrees? So it builds in all those components so kids are aware of their options. The four-year high school course taking plan is mapping out your 24 credits that are required of graduation now, what years you might take those 24 credits, what classes would meet those requirements. Um, the resume is requirement for graduation for seniors. Um, that's across Washington State. Uh, in Tacoma, we encourage our sophomores to start completing their resumes. A lot of them are looking for uh, first-time employment uh, in the summertime. Uh, so uh, sophomore, junior, and senior, we, we work on that. Uh, federal and state financial aid, ranging from the FAFSA, the WASPA, and also includes college-bound scholarship information uh, for income-eligible families uh, to complete their applications. And then item six is something you as a board of directors uh, had approved uh, well, 10 years, going on 11 years. This is unique to Tacoma Public Schools. It's another reason why we chose to build our own platform is that we can build verified acceptance to the next institution. That's where our students uh, apply uh, for admissions for post-secondary education. When they get their uh, acknowledgement or acceptance letters, they upload it into their portfolio. This is something that we have logged for 10 years now um, in the benchmark project of the Whole Child Initiative. Next slide, please. Um, professional development, what we're really focused on at CT is we are aligned with uh, curriculum instruction and the equity department's uh, professional development choices. So CT uh, certificate staff participate in them. In addition, um, our staff are also involved in book studies on culturally responsive teaching. Uh, we have developed a CTE culture development team uh, we call ourselves uh, Shared Voices. Uh, we're meeting virtually every two weeks for an hour. And it's about real talk. It's about relationship building, uh, the challenge that our children, our families face during COVID, um, remote learning, um, and those pieces. We also um, did in-service at the beginning of the year with the distance learning playbook to help our uh, teachers uh, become more accustomed and comfortable uh, with the virtual platform. I'd like to call your attention to uh, the program review and approval process, it's, it's unique to CTE. It's, it's different than basic education. It's required of OSPI that every five years we review our curriculum. I'm very proud to say that Tacoma, with our advisory committees, uh, we've, we've ramped it up quite a bit. Uh, we made a comprehensive program review uh, that includes not only the curriculum development, it has the student leadership alignment, the alignment of industry recognized certifications, CTE advisory committees, uh, our instructional materials, our software that we use for CTE, the CT dual credit that I mentioned earlier, um, House Bill 1599, which set up CT graduation pathways as options. So we built this comprehensive program. So when we do a review, we build it all together. So we have alignment uh, for, for student learning. And then the last one on there for professional development is the incident prevention program, primarily for our shop type industrial settings uh, uh, to reduce the uh, potential of accidents in the workplace. Um, next slide. This is our last slide, and uh, that's why I came before you tonight. Uh, I want to thank you for your support of uh, career and technical education. Um, to submit a grant of this size requires uh, board approval, and I wanted to uh, call your attention and make you aware of the uh, the CLNA and the district-wide plan that we use here in Tacoma Public Schools. Thank you, Mr. Page. Uh, I'll open it up for questions, starting with Vice President Bombright. Well, Thank you, um, Mr. Page. I appreciate deeply the hard work that you and your team do and that all of our community partners do in helping to support um, the students as they as they you know seek out and explore career options and really grow and learn a lot of, of skills that are as well as be educated about um, different components. And I want to um, thank you and encourage you to continue sending emails to the to the board when um, when exciting things happen. Um, it's I always find it um, uplifting and um, thrilling actually to see what some of these kids have done and um, how hard they've worked and to see that they can um, you know move forward. And you know, I, for example, the today I watched the uh, the Rams, the the Wilson Rams um, radio uh, Veterans Day. Um, Piece, which was just moving and wonderful that these kids take this stuff on on their own and, and move forward and, and grow from it. So thank you for, um, and thank please thank the whole team at CTE for everything that you guys do. Um, um, Director Keating. 
Any comments? Oh, I just the I just want to thank um, John for the presentation um, and um, echo what Vice President Von Bright said about keep the um, updates coming because it's really great to just have um, to kind of it feels like following along. Um, and on a personal note, as someone who um, has had a professional career um, in um, outs uh, in the as a uh, oh my gosh, what's the word I'm trying to say? Um, outside of college academia, like I really appreciate um, just the um, opportunities that students get, uh, that there are a lot of different career paths that don't um, have to go through college. So I just appreciate the dedication to that opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Leon, any comments? Yeah, thank you very much for your leadership, Mr. Page, and your team. Um, I think I think mean, you know building this uh, the system in schoology yourself. I think that's that's challenging, but I think it, you're building a system that works for our students best and integrates with um, the rest of the kind of educational philosophy that from what the schools has. Um, specifically, you know, using the cultural developmental development teams to to uh, to understand kind of the philosophy, the feelings, the things that are going on in uh, different cultures as they try to get this education and move forward into careers. Um, obviously, distance learning is a, a massive thing now. It's always been, not always, it's been around in some way or another. You know, correspondence courses existed long ago, uh, but it's quite uh, uh, robust now, and, and it's going to stay robust for a while. So um, the other piece that's important, I think, is for everyone to see and realize just when you blend uh, thinking about careers at an early age so that you know, sometimes Students over here don't always understand why they're taking these core classes in school, but really the core classes blend really well with what society and careers need them to do. And you've got them building the, experiencing the career classes and getting those jobs and doing the resumes, the things that are gonna make them successful in life. is so important no matter uh, if it's you know, technical, military, then, then technical, and then, or college, wherever they are. Uh, your services are so so important and valuable. So um, it'd be nice to have more students take part in in in, in your program in your classes. So um, we can we can talk about that later. Ways to get more kids in your program. So. <laughs> right now, right now. Dr. any comments? Oh, why? Yeah, yeah. John Page, thank you so much for your uh, for your presentation. Um, I just want to make sure that I understood. So you said the program that you're building is going to embed into Schoology. It's going to work hand in hand with Schoology. The, the high school and beyond plan for yeah. the for the high school and beyond plan. Yes. Yeah. And I I just want to say thank you for that because one of our student reps just mentioned the difficulty in uh, getting used to multiple programs. So with this being embedded, I think you'll see a higher success rate um, in students completing the high school and beyond plan. It may be at an earlier state if it's uh, embedded in the program. So I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you. I mean, this is, uh, I'm thanking you guys as a team. I, I so appreciate the challenges this board of directors and our, our superintendent's office is always a challenge to be innovative uh, for our kids. The CTE team, our teachers, our kids, our families, uh, the support team behind it, it's just, it's outstanding. It's just a real privilege for me to get to tell little parts of this story on behalf of what our, our kids, families, and the staff are doing. I just have one clarifying question, John. Um, you mentioned with the Vanny, in your specific example, you talked about acceptance letters from post-secondary. Like, I, it sounded more like, um, like, like institutions like college, higher institutions of higher ed, rather than like acceptance into the military or any of those other things. The Vanny is about this the next step, right? Or is has that changed? But it's all the next steps, right? Thank, th thank you for clarifying for people in the meeting and, and viewers at home. Um, Vanny, as you said, uh, President Cobb, it includes military service, um, apprenticeships, uh, trade school, um, technical and community colleges, universities. What's important about Vanny is that there's really two components. It doesn't tell us where kids actually show up, but what it tells us is that they have a competitive transcript to pursue the option that they're interested in. They've taken the right courses to get accepted. And it tells us that regardless of what school they're at, 
regardless of their zip code or where they are from Tacoma, they've got the encouragement and support and the expectation of the community to make application that you're worthy, um, then you're prepared to do this. So as you'd said, uh, Director Cobb, is that uh, we value all lines of, of career endeavors across this district and all lines of employment. We just wanna make sure our kids have the right encouragement and support. Thank you. And just to build on that, I just wanna say how important it is to keep um, lifting these programs up. Like me, I, I don't know what I thought I was gonna do. I thought I was gonna be a dual degree engineering major. <laughs> And then I had to take calculus at eight o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and I became a sociology major. <laughs> so we all don't really know what we're doing, but in senior year, I'll give a shout out to Mr. Murphy, who I think is retired, long, long retired from Lincoln. I loved stained glass with him. Mm -hmm. So I recently, in like the last three years, learned about this university in the South somewhere. The community was devastated by hurricanes and they started this four-year degree program, but where you also learn a skilled trade. Mm -hmm. Had I known that that program existed and I could have been working on stained glass windows while getting an, a sociology degree, mm -hmm. I might have wanted to pursue that. So I just think that continuing to ensure that students have access to lots of different pathways and can make, like you said, advantage the choice that's right for them is critical. So thanks for your presentation. Well, actually, last thing, I just want to double down on or double back to a point that you made about federal Perkins dollars only being 1.5% of our CTE budget. I assume the balance is state funds. And um, given that it's such a small percentage, what do you think is the value of engaging with Perkins? Because I imagine, too, that a lot of requirements come with receiving the federal funds. So what's the value of engaging in both the state and um, federal funding opportunities for CTE? Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a beautiful question. Really, to be in the innovative district, what we're charged of doing here in Tacoma, we've got to press outside the box a lot. Um, our summer programs, for example, really there's no funding stream for them um, through apportionment. Same with our after school programs. So um, industry, rec for example, the industry recognized certifications like Merchant Mariner, I'll put that one out there, OSHA 10, forklift operator, uh, food workers permit, all those permits to get kids ready for industry or uh, if they want to work while they're going to college or whatever they're choosing to do, now there is a cost to those. And so that's where, you know, we put money behind that uh, through the Perkins grants, discretionary money. We can break, we can remove barriers to access uh, for kids to access uh, in demand. Uh, family wage careers. Um, we can, with that money, we could do things that some would consider really not, you know, the traditional norm of what you do in a classroom. Uh, what, that's what we're trying to do with our innovative programs is really uh, put our kids and our staff with subject matter experts that are really current in the field. Uh, okay. That we don't have the expertise for that. Those are big ones. Um, uh, field trips, we have, you know, as soon as we get the permission from the, the health department, we believe it's very important for kids to have opportunity to establish their identity uh, in different career pathways. That, you know, to, to send them up to Microsoft or send them over to Amazon or the, 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 the list of industry partners that want to partner with Tacoma and, and receive our kids and tell their story. And because and, you guys know when the economy is booming, when it's booming, they're looking for, you know, the, the Northwest, you know. Uh, we have a pretty stellar economy, and so they're looking for Tacoma graduates, and we get kids out every opportunity we can. Uh, so that's when school is in session, we did do we do and we continue to use uh, money to support field trips. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Garcia. Did you have your hand up? Yep, just two quick ones, uh, just to build on John's uh, comments that that. Um, discretionary money John's team also you know pays for those students to get the certification and so he really takes them from classroom living room all the way through the certification program including if this, they're not able to earn the certification in, uh, until they're 18 years old and they do it before his team literally gets them registered signs they students uh, take the test beforehand and then they get a birthday message saying happy birthday don't forget to uh, go get your certification it's already completed and stuff and so those those resources are there uh, and then Van is really critical because um, many school districts have a high school and beyond plan and says what's your plan and the subtlety with Vanny is, is that there is a verified acceptance into that next institution and that's really important from an equity perspective to say is k-12 doing their job uh, there, are, there are many uh, 
variables to why a student may not complete their post-secondary experience. They may not go to their post-secondary experience, but we have a, an opportunity to at least ensure that they have that opportunity and it's confirmed. And so that's the subtlety of Vanny compared to a lot of other communities that just have a, a beyond or what is your 13 year plan. So thank you. Great job tonight, John. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Um, any last comments? I know we still have a lot ahead of us, so I'll keep us moving and I'll try to hold my questions too. But all right, moving on to item number 12, business matters. 12.1, approval of acceptance of Title III English Language Learners Grant from the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. The superintendent recommends that the board of directors approve acceptance of the Title III grant from the Office of Superintendent Superintendent of Public Instruction in the amount of $443,722 and expenditure of funds in accordance with accepted guidelines. Funding Thank source, you. Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Sorry. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt that 12.1? Okay. Motion to adopt. I so move. Oh, sorry. There a second? A second. Been moved and seconded. All um, any questions about item 12.1? Seeing none. All those in favor of adopting 12.1, say aye. 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 Opposed. Um, the motion is adopted. Just a reminder for folks who are not speaking or who won't be teed up to speak. Please remember to mute your mics. Item 12.2: Approval of acceptance of Title Title VI Indian Education Grant from Department of Education. The superintendent recommends the board of directors approve acceptance of the Title VI Indian Education Grant from the Department of Education in the amount of $195,682 for period July 1, 2020 through June 30, 2021, and expenditure of funds according to the accepted guidelines. Funding source, Department of Education. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.2? I move to adopt. Is there a second? I second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions second. about item 12.2? Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting item 12.2 say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item 12.3, approval of acceptance of special education IDEA Part B grants from the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. The deputy superintendent recommends the board of directors approves acceptance of the special education IDEA Part B grants from the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction in the amount of $6,798,788 and expenditure of funds in accordance with the accepted guidelines. Funding source, Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. Is there a motion to adopt? I so move. I so move. Oh, I second. So moving you can second. Get Corey, Corey's first motion. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Questions about item 12.3. We had a couple of discussion phones from uh, directors, uh, Director Cobb. Was this the only money that is spent uh, by the Tacoma Public Schools on special education? And the answer is, is no, we do spend local dollars as well. And it varies from year to year based off of students' IEP needs and program needs. So we can bring that specific local dollar investment back to you at a later board meeting. I don't know if Rosalind has it off the top of her head. I, I have it numbers in my head ringing, but uh, we'll bring that back to you as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. And just for the rest, I'll say just for a couple of these items, many of these um, grants that we are moving through right now are federally funded grants, just as we talked about CTE and the Carl Perkins program, that's federal funds, but there are also some companion state level funds. So I just want to acknowledge that for many of these federal funding sources, there are also state funding sources that along and other local dollars that get spent to fund the entire programs just to um, bring a little bit more context to um, Dr. Garcia's comments. So thank you. All those in favor of adopting item 12.3 say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item 12.4, approval of interlocal agreement with Columbia Virtual Academy. The deputy superintendent recommends that the board of directors approve this interlocal agreement with Columbia Virtual Academy, CVA, and authorize the superintendent to sign the agreement. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.4? I have a motion to adopt. Is there a second? Second. 
It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments about item 12.4? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting item 12.4, say aye. 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 Motion, uh, any opposed? Motion is adopted. Item 12.5, approval of acceptance of partnerships for social emotional learning initiative grant amendment number three from the Wallace Foundation. The deputy superintendent recommends that the board of directors approve acceptance of the partnership for social emotional learning initiative grant amendment number three from the Wallace Foundation in the amount of $1,050,000 for the period of October 30th, 1st, excuse me, 2021 through August 31st, 2023 and expenditure of funds according to accepted guidelines funding source, the Wallace Foundation. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.5? I so move. Is there a second? A second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments about item 12.5? Madam President, it should just be noted that the Wallace Foundation has done uh, just yeoman's work in investing in Tacoma under the superintendent's leadership. We were one of uh, six cities competed out of hundreds nationwide, and they continue to invest in the work around the Tacoma Hall Child Initiative and there. And so just a, a tremendous thank you to the Wallace Foundation. I know they're not watching necessarily because they're on the East Coast, but, um, and then the whole child team for their leadership and leading it. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Any other comments? Oh, Director Keating, I see your hand. Yeah, I was curious um, about the grant ending in 2023. Um, is is there, um, my anticipation is that there would be an, um, at least a continuation of this, but is there a plan beyond 2023 with the Wallace grant and foundation? So this is actually a uh, continuation from the first stage. And so they continue to invest. And so they have not signaled um, um, anything about it ongoing after the 2023, but the Wallace Foundation has a long history of investing in communities. And so their investment may look different in Tacoma, but it, typically um, they continue to invest in communities for sustainable change. So uh, this would be a continuation from the first grant um, and millions, like I said, of dollars have already been invested. Uh, and not to the Tacoma Public Schools, but to the Tacoma community, after school providers, infrastructure. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting item number 12.5, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item 12.6, approval of acceptance of best grant from the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. The Deputy Superintendent, on behalf of the Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, recommends the Board of Directors approve the acceptance of the best grant from the Office of Superintendent of Public Construction in the amount of $197,000 and expenditure of funds in accordance with accepted guidelines. Funding source, Office of Superintendent of Public Construction. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.6? Motion to adopt. Is there a second? Second. Then moved and seconded. Any questions about item 12.6? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is adopted. Item 12.7, approval of acceptance of TPEP grant from the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. The Deputy Superintendent on behalf of the Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning recommends the Board of Directors approve acceptance of the TPEP grant from the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction in the amount of $107,605 and expenditure of funds in accordance with accepted guidelines. Funding source, Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. Is there a motion to adopt item 12 point, I'm losing track, 12.7? I motion to adopt. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Any questions about item 12.7? And just as a reminder for the public, again, there are a lot of acronyms listed in these items. Please refer to the meeting materials for further description about what these grants actually are. Um, all those in favor of adopting item 12.7, please say aye. 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 Motion is adopted. Item 12.8, approval of acceptance of OSSI district grant from the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Assistant Superintendent of K-12 Support recommends that the Board of Directors approve acceptance of the OSSI district grant 
from the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction in the amount of $320,000 and expenditures of funds in assistance with accepted guidelines. Funding source, Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.8? So move. Is there a second? A second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions about item 12.8? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is adopted. Item 12.9, approval of excessive Title I Part D grants from the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. The Assistant Superintendent K-12 support recommends that the Board of Directors approve acceptance of the Title I Part D grant from the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction in the amount of $246,561 and expenditure of funds in accordance with accepted guidelines. Funding source, Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to adopt item 12.9? Motion to adopt. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The item is adopted. Item 12.10, approval of contract amend, a contract addendum number two between Edgenuity and Tacoma Public Schools for the 2020-2021 school year. The Assistant Superintendent of K-12 Support recommends that the Board of Directors approve the addendum Number two to contract number TSD 19026 between Edge Annuity and Tacoma Public Schools for an estimated cost of $1 million for the 2020 2021 school year. Funding source secondary education. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.10? Motion to adopt. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Any questions about item 12.10? Seeing none, all those in favor of adoption say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item 12.11, approval of the Carl Perkins 5 grant application for the 2020-2021 school year. The Assistant Superintendent of K-12 Support on behalf of the Director of Career and Technical Education recommends that the Board of Directors approve the application submission for the Carl Perkins 5 grant on a five-year cycle with the 2020-2021 school year being year two for an estimated grant amount of $271,185. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.11? Motion to adopt. Um, I second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions from the board or comments? Um, Ms. Pace, can you clarify why this is the second year of the five-year cycle and how this came to us at this point in time? That's a really good question. Hopefully, John Page is still on. You can yes. help us out um, with that, John. Yeah, because it's administered to the United States Department of Education, it has to be renewed every five years by an act of Congress, actually. Um, so last year, it was it was previously Perkins 4 until last year, it became Perkins 5. Uh, we do have to resubmit each year. Um, Thank you. But it's been reauthorized programmatically for, five, for its new five-year cycle. Yes, that's correct, uh, President okay. Tom. Thank you. Thank you, John. All those in favor of adopting item 12.11, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion? Okay. The motion is adopted. Item 12.12, approval of contract number TSD 15159 between Sonatrol and Tacoma Public Schools for the 2020-2021 school year. The Assistant Superintendent of K-12 Support on behalf of the Director of Safety and Security recommends that the Board of Directors approve contract number TSD 15159, addendum number four, between Sonatrol Pacific and Tacoma Public Schools for the 2020-2021 school year. Funding source, safety and security budget. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.12? Motion to adopt. There's a second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting item 12.12, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Motion is adopted. Item 12.13, approval of child care agreement between Metro Parks Tacoma and Tacoma Public Schools. The Assistant Superintendent of K-12 Support on behalf of the Director of Student Life recommends that the Board of Directors approve the child care agreement between Metro Parks Tacoma and Tacoma Public Schools for the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.13? I so move. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting item 12.13, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item 12.14, approval of the acceptance of school assistance program grant amendment number one from Pierce County. The chief financial officer recommends that the board of directors approve acceptance of the school assistance program grant amendment number one from Pierce County in the amount of $750,000 and expenditure of funds in accordance with the accepted guidelines. Funding source Pierce County. Thank you. Um, is there a motion from the board to adopt item 12.14? Motion to adopt. Is there a second? Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting item 12.14 say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item 12.15, approval of contract extension with Blue Granite from the for the data warehouse project. Chief Information Officer recommends that the Board of Directors approve the funding request with a contract estimate up to $600,000 to continue work on the data warehouse and assist in the upcoming migration of existing data to the new HR and finance systems. Funding source, technology levy funds. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt item 12.15? I motion to adopt. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting item 12.15, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Ooh, that was a list. <laughs> it's so funny working in this virtual setting. When we're all together, we can make eye contact and we say aye together. It's just a little thing. So thanks for all for moving through that. Um, item 13, other business. 13.1, approval of resolution number 2093, certifying educational programs and operations levy 2021 collection. The chief financial officer recommends that the board of directors adopt resolution 2093 to approve the 2020 educational programs and operations replacement levy for the 2021 collection in the amount of $73,871,787. Is there a motion to adopt item 13.1? I so move. Is there a second? Second. second. So moved and seconded. Ms. Medina, can you give a brief description of this item? Sure. So generally we have to um, submit to the county and to our educational service district and to OSPI, the amount of levy that we will collect each year in our various levy collection, our taxes that we're submitting for the general public to pay. Uh, and what we normally find is that what we adopt in our budget is what we're able to collect. Uh, that is when you technically certify the amounts. However, uh, with the new levy collection requirements and the changes in the laws in the recent years, when we ran the calculations, our voter approved levy amount of $74 million was too much. And so we had to do what's called a rollback. Therefore, uh, after we finished the calculation, the maximum amount of levy that we can collect is the $73.871 million. We're bringing that back down from the $74 million range. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting item 13.1 say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item 13.2, priority benchmarks adoption. The superintendent recommends that the board of directors approve the benchmarks for the 2020 through 2025 strategic plan priority benchmark. 
Do you mind, Superintendent Center, and just giving a quick recap of the process that we, not the full process that we engaged in, but just where how, how these priority benchmarks figure into our strategic plan, overall benchmarks, and um, what the purpose of identifying priorities really is? So the board this year went through a process of identifying um, a new strategic plan to take us from 2020 to 2025. And so through that benchmark, I mean, through that benchmarking process, they identified five goals, and those were academic excellence, partnerships, early learning, health and safety, and operations. And so then they uh, worked with the community, uh, went out and surveyed uh, community leaders and made sure they got some acceptable benchmarks that the community was willing to buy into and that uh, really would serve to uh, help us reach those goals. And so we ended up with benchmarks. Then uh, we asked the board to also come up with some specific uh, benchmark, uh, priority benchmarks. That would really be the ones that the staff would focus on and make sure you know that we accomplish those and that we uh, establish measures. And so for, uh, for academic excellence, we really focused in on um, the percentage of students scoring um, out of looking at the proficiency level at the math smarter balance assessment. For partnerships, um, the board really decided they wanted to focus on community-based and youth-based organizations and formal partnerships with schools. So that was a little departure from what we'd done before. In early learning, uh, especially during the influence of COVID and our loss of students, we, uh, the board decided to look at the number of students being served in preschool programs. And then health and safety, you decided, you, you talked a lot about two that you really wanted, and so you ended up with two priority benchmarks. One, that every school would complete and publish a summary of their annual social emotional learning plan, and two, uh, that you would look at the percentage of students with no exclusionary uh, discipline, and that's at all levels. And then for operations, the annual percentage of fund balance maintained. And so all of those benchmarks will serve as your benchmark reports. And um, I just need to say on a personal note, I thought that you did a really extensive job and um, really looked thoroughly at each one of those. So I really appreciated your thorough discussions. Thank you for that overview. I just wanna give members of the board an opportunity to react to these um, priorities as we've established as we've established them and just give any additional thoughts about the process. If, um, I'll start with um, Vice President Bonbright. Thank you. Um, yes, I really uh, also, this being my first year, uh, full year on the board and the benchmarks um, from, from the previous strategic plan, we kind of, I kind of inherited. So this was the first year that I've had an opportunity to really work through the entire process and just wanted to say I thought it was, um, um, it was impressive the way everybody really spoke up about what was important to them, what they felt was critical. I did want to, uh, so I appreciate the process, and it was it was long and interrupted by COVID, but we perceive, you know, we per uh, persevered. But um, I did want to uh, point out too for the for the public um, that just because we've chosen these priority benchmarks within each of the uh, goal areas, and we uh, um, the superintendent and team are focused on all of the benchmarks and uh, in each goal, and um, we'll be reporting on all of them, but in, in not in a focus as much of a focused way. So um, none of them it's it's none of them are unimportant. They're all important. And so we just wanted to make sure that these were the ones, given the scenario that we're experiencing right now, and um, some challenges that we've been having in terms of um, reaching our data points that we felt uh, collectively that these um, were the priority ones we wanted to spend the next um, year on. So thank you for, for uh, your support, uh, Superintendent Santorno and team. Thank you. Um, do, Director Keating, any comments about the priority benchmarks before we take action? Um, I'll just, uh, build off of what uh, Director Bombright said in terms of um, just that that there wasn't it was really um, kind of a difficult thing to for us to process through because everything feels and is equally important and so having to narrow it down was really challenging um, and I just also want to thank the superintendent and um, 
deputy superintendent for keeping um, at least me every time I'm like, wait a minute, what is the pro what are we doing again? How is this working? Because we've had so much coming at us um, over the last eight months, particularly that um, just staying on track and helping us as a board stay on track. I just really appreciate um, the um, endless support that um, I that we've received. So thank you. Director Leon, any comments? Sure, I'll just comment on like just the health and safety one. So we've got two of them there, um, but one of them is basically the building block, social emotional learning curriculum to make sure the whole community knows what is being done at each school. And one of the outcomes of that would be the, uh, the, what we're measuring on uh, basically trying to prevent kids from being excluded from school, which means suspension or expulsion. So it's kind of an end one, an end measurement and then also kind of a beginning base block building measurement that we're looking at there. So it's just an example of some of the many ways we, we try to evaluate and improve our system here. Thanks. Dr. Strozier? And recognize uh, no real too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no real comment other than you know these are definitely inherited, but I'm I'm looking forward to contributing in any way. Yeah, I'll just say too. I encourage members of the board. Um, oh, just as a heads up, we have not members of the board community. We've been in the process of making changes to the website um in the last several months that many of you have probably noticed. So, um, this area of our website too will continue to get refined as we um. Um, keep implementing these new benchmarks and priorities. So please, as that happens, take a look to see the full suite of benchmarks that are established under each of these um, goal areas. And I'll just say too, from a process standpoint, the addition of this operational strategic goal is new. Um, as the pre prior board members, we kept getting updates on things that are operational in nature, but we didn't have a goal area to really um, put an umbrella over all of those things. So this is, I think, a great development in our strategic plan as we move forward. And lastly, um, my, I will just comment briefly on the health and safety benchmark priorities too. I think um, I agree 100% with Director Leong's comments and think that the continued focus on exclusionary discipline may not seem completely relevant right now in the same way that it felt last year and in prior years because we're not in face-to-face um, we're not in a face-to-face -face context, but this was one area that we continued to, especially at the middle school level, need to see progress, especially related to racial disparities in exclusionary discipline. It had made a lot of good progress, but I just want to make sure definitely to keep an eye on this as we think about transitioning back into face-to-face -face and not knowing really what the social dynamics will be between kids and kids, kids and adults, as we all have been at our homes and a little bit at a distance from each other for so long. So I think this is a really good place for us to focus this collection of priorities as we move forward. So just thank you all for the input on the process and looking forward to really operationalizing these in our upcoming benchmark report moving forward. Also too, I'll just point out quickly like this, I had this thought like, why don't we ever just report on them all at once? And it was direct, Dr. Garcia reminded me that the data for all of these comes at different points in the year. And so that's just a point to, to, um, rec to call out for the community to be mindful of that the presentation and updates on these items kind of corresponds to when new data is available related to these items. So ideally, it would be great to do it all at once and get annual snapshots or quarterly, but it does data doesn't just work like that. So again, thank you all for your input on this. So since there has been a motion and it's been seconded, well, sorry, one more piece of context related to goal. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge that these are the priority benchmarks that we've established related to the boards and the district's five-year strategic plan. In addition, the board adopts annual goals for ourselves that we want to be focused on and make progress toward. And so the board has established some high-level goals, um, three high-level goals for ourselves that we will continue to have conversations about what they really mean and to develop some objectives for the school year related to those goals. I think one of them relates nicely to this partnership priority around community-based and youth-based organizations. As a board goal, we prioritize this year 
the family and student engagement. So we can think about how uh, from a board perspective to operationalize that um, this year too. So please um, stay tuned for more conversations about board goals that are definitely aligned to these strategic plan goals, but not the same thing. So just for context. Okay, the motion had, we've had a motion and we've seconded. So all those in favor of adopting item 13.2 on priority benchmarks, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Great. Reports to the board. There are no reports to the board tonight. Item 15, board comments and reports. I will start with Vice President Bonwright. Any comments or reports tonight? Yeah, it's um, it's been a busy busy month since the last meeting. Um, have basically been working hard with JMAC, which is the Joint Municipal Action Committee, uh, which is made up of um, six or uh, seven agency representation of, of elected bodies here in Pierce County, City of Tacoma, the um, County Council. Um, Port of Tacoma, Metro Parks Tacoma, um, uh, the um, Tacoma uh, Public Schools, and um, the Pierce Transit, and the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. And so the group has been um, has been around for quite a while, but but we've been talking about um, how we could better align our individual agency responses, um, especially around COVID nineteen. Uh, during the pandemic through a collective lens um, around shared interests such, such as equity. And so we've uh, becoming closer and closer to, to um, solidifying a process, a formal process for JMAC to be effectively um, zeroing in and targeting its, uh, its collective resources. And so that's taken a, a good amount of time, which is I think gonna have positive results for the community. Um, secondly, and I, I'm gonna let um, Director Keating talked more about this, but participated in the WASDA weekly webinars that um, happen around uh, what's going on, especially around the pandemic generated uh, issues around uh, serving on um, on a board of directors at, for school districts and kind of uh, the different policy issues that are, that are coming up and legislative priorities and a whole a whole host of other things. And so um, I think um, Director Keating's got some items to share on, from the most recent couple of weeks. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about actually uh, is the, you know, one of the things I like the best, which is we, as many of you know, and the public may not know, but every year at the beginning of the school year, we, um, as board members, were assigned to a cluster of schools. There's five Clusters be, uh, they're they're fo focused around the um, comprehensive high each of the five comprehensive high schools and the feeder schools uh, middle and elementary schools that generally go up to those high schools plus of course we've got Sammy Soda and Idea and others that are mingled in uh, among these and so each one of us generally has one or two high schools and uh, you know uh, two or three middle schools and and then a whole host of like twelve or thirteen elementary schools. And, um, and so we just changed from the ones we had last school year to the new ones. And so um, my, I love to reach out and, and usually at this time I would be visiting the schools, which of course we can't do, although you can jump in on some classes that are going on, but really uh, it, it is much harder to connect. Plus, uh, didn't want to add burdens to any of the schools as they're getting ready um, and getting you know, up to speed on this whole remote learning. But uh, this past couple of weeks, this past week, I did reach out, uh, started my principal outreach, which is what I'm, I'm going to be reaching out to every, all of the principals in my new service delivery area. Um, and so as a liaison to them, and I, I spent time talking with um, the principal, Casey Cox, from First Creek Middle School. Um, and he is brand new this year to Tacoma Public Schools and has great innovative ideas and has a lot of challenges at First Creek that he's diving into with his team and I'm very excited about the work I'm hearing that's going on there. I uh, also spoke uh, to, with um, Kim Messersmith, who's the principal at Stewart Middle School. And again, um, lots of great energy and creative um, progress towards um, some some old, you know, maybe issues and goals that they had, but also some new ones. And, and um, it's pretty exciting work. Uh, also had the opportunity to speak with Pat Irwin at um, Lincoln High School, 
And uh, boy, uh, he had a lot to share and a lot of great things to to um, um, to fill me in on and how how things work at Lincoln and and um, what are some of the successes and barriers that they've been faced due to COVID. And then lastly, I, I had the opportunity to um, talk to an entire leadership team, four four folks from Idea uh, High School. And um, well, my daughter went to to Soda, so I'm very used to the the three you know kind of innovative high school unique approach that they have. Um, Idea didn't exist when my my uh, kids were in, so um, it was really fun to hear about how that project has uh, evolved and. Um, and actually they did a really interesting presentation for me. And if you haven't seen the video that they put together um, to help recruit new kids to SOTA, it's it's pretty much features three, uh, one C gal who's now a senior and two graduates and it's fabulous. So um, that's, I just wanted to say, um, I know uh, our principals are working tirelessly to help try and lead their teams through this pandemic. And I just want to, again, thank um, these folks that, that I met with uh, in the last couple of weeks and, and say to the uh, my elementary team of, of principals, I'm coming to talk to you soon. So um, can't wait to hear what you have to say. So thanks to, to everyone. And, and most of all, thank you to all of the principals who I know are working super hard to, to make sure that kids are getting what they need and, and their staff is as well. Thank you. Um, Director Keating, any comments or reports tonight? Um, just, a f I'll try to keep it short. Um, so in terms of WASDA, um, OPMA waiver was extended again. Um, and I didn't catch when it was, but I know it's sometime, I think it's sometime in December, but um, I think uh, what is important for the public, I mean, and given that the increased rates of cases da um, daily, um, boards cannot meet or yet we can't meet in person until we're in phase three. Um, and so that's a continuation. And then annual conference for WASDA is next starts next Wednesday. Um, and there's some pretty um, relevant um, programming for our board goals and then strategic um, benchmarks as well. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then um, I've been on the Safe Streets Committee, and that meeting has been canceled a couple different times, but it's rescheduled for this on the 18th. Um, and so I know um, I serve as a commissioner for the Human Services Commission for the City of Tacoma, and because of OPMA, um, uh, the commission or no other commissions could meet um, due to, until there was an update of OPMA that uh, allowed them to. So for, for commissions, for example, we weren't... Um, we had a, our last meeting was in February and then we just were able to meet a couple of weeks ago for the first time. So OPMA has um, interestingly impacted a lot of other actually important work that happens um, in our community. And then the other thing that um, isn't necessarily a committee report, but I wanted to share this with the public um, because of the record high numbers of cases last Wednesday, which at that time was 214. Um, I tuned into the Tac uh, Tacoma Pierce County Health Board business meeting, which I hadn't done previously, and there was some really interesting information. Um, one thing that I thought was really notable is that the health department um, is providing food and care packages for households that are isolating, um, and I thought that that was um, really just uh, helpful information to know, particularly if um, someone is having to isolate that they may or may not know that there are resources um, or a, a household. Um, and then the, I don't have a lot of information about it, but um, Tacoma Pierce County is um, partnering with four. Oh, sorry, my cat came in and just meowed, but um, <laughs> is partnering with four um, rural school districts um, on a testing pilot program. And so um, for COVID testing, excuse me, I know when we say testing, I have to remind myself, what kind of testing are we talking about? Um, and so I, th I think that, I don't know when that exactly is gonna get underway. And then the other thing that was most um, notable to me in the that meeting was that 
Um, out of the populations that are um, testing positive for COVID, youth 20 years and younger are the fastest growing population. Um, and so school age children are the fastest growing um, in positive cases is what Dr. Anthony Chen had said during that meeting. And that um, out of that population, um, young males are the one that are least likely to get tested um, and have higher rates of um, positivity. And so they're working on a, a campaign to help um, encourage youth to get tested um, and also help them take the safety precautions that we've all been talking about for months. So I thought that was really um, notable because, and you know, today's case numbers were 245. So, um, and we have Thanksgiving coming up and um, holidays beyond that. So. Um, I'm a little anxious about where we're headed in our county and um, across the state and in the nation. So hopefully families that are out there listening, um, uh, it seems like the youth in our community are not following safety protocols and maybe we can all work a little harder to help um, mentor and guide them to maybe make safer choices. So um, that's all. Thank you, Director Keating. Your comment about young men, this made me picture in my mind driving by Candle Park or driving by Franklin Park. The basketball courts are full with majority young men. So it's a really good push and a good reminder, especially having one in our household. <laughs> like they need to, uh, we all need to, but that's a good push. So thank you for sharing. Um, Director Leon, any comments tonight? Or reports? Uh, report, just, uh, just uh, echoing. Uh, please try to do your best to stay um, safe with Thanksgiving coming. It's going to be hard to say uh, to do that, but it's important just probably not to get together or get together outside if you can um, wear some warm clothes um, if you have to at a, at a safe distance, but probably a year to take off. Um, and the hospital is more and more full right now, so uh, there's not very many beds left in, in uh, the hospital where I work, so we need to we're, we're making arrangements to make extra space in places we normally don't use. So it's it's getting it's getting full. It's getting serious. Thank you, Dr. Strozier. Any thoughts None. or reflections tonight? Either it doesn't have to be specifically a report from the committee because we haven't um, finalized your assignments. But any just thoughts? No pressure either. Yeah, no, no, I'm good. I just appreciate everybody who shared tonight, kind of opened my eyes to how things actually work. And I think I can kind of nestle in my seat here and, and get comfortable with contributing. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any comments from our two student board members, our standing members? Um, Jasmine, any comments, further comments tonight? Um, well, I guess. So um, I talked about this a few meetings ago. My school was organizing a talent show for the fall. Um, it went over really, really well, especially the teachers seem to really, really appreciate it. Um, and so we're organizing one for the winter. And we're also trying to encourage um, members of our community, like our school community, to send in photos of their pets um, because people seem to get really, really excited about that. And so we're trying to look at different things like that, like the little things that people have, like the time to like put some energy into and that's just kind of like fun um yeah <laughs> thank you thanks jasmine nathan any um comments or, or thoughts you want to share tonight yeah sure um i just i just want to say that I already have uh learned a whole lot of like a lot of the processes and everything it was interesting uh sitting through all the different approvals and the discussions and yeah i, I think this is this is fantastic so far thank you Okay, I just have, uh, I know, every one comment, one more question kind of comment. Um, I didn't think about to ask this during the course of the superintendent's report and the COVID update, but um, something, I think it was the approval of the Title I Part D grant, which is neglected and delinquent. I hate that title, but I think that is the official title. Made me wonder um, what the current context of both, um, not enrollment, but enrollment in our case, but... Um, um, the current, I'm wondering now about the current status of Raymond Hall, 
in the education programs offered at Raymond Hall or where other places where youth are incarcerated and how um, our move to online learning, remote learning has um, played out in that context. I don't need an answer tonight, don't need it now, but just, just one element of our programming we haven't really talked much about, so it'd be really helpful to get just some update in the Friday report or in some format about our programs there. So I just wanted to say that now. We'll Matter that of Thank you. My other reporting item is I um, shared a link with board members um, to an article that was published just a couple of days ago in a publication, online publication called The 74. And it was part of a piece um, that was titled Dear Adult Learners and hashtag listen to youth. I just want to give a shout out to one of our um, School of the Arts students, Jasmine Moran. She targeted me, not targeted in a negative sense, but called me out as uh, one of our adult leaders and really calling us to really engage with them in conversations about eliminating racism in teaching and racism in curriculum. So I just wanted to acknowledge her engagement in this effort and her um, engagement with this overall project. That's a project of, I think, an organization called America's Promise Alliance. So I plan on following up with Jasmine and connecting with her about her piece here. But I just wanted to call attention to this national effort that some of our local students, Jasmine at um, School of the Arts, are engaged in related to, again, using your voice. So again, want to thank Jasmine and Nathan Indigo and Caitlin all for being here tonight. We will look forward to continuing to engage with you all and look forward to like hearing your thoughts about how we can together work to make things work for all students in Tacoma Public Schools. So I don't have any further report. So with that, we will move on to item number 15 or item number 16, announcement of the board meetings. On Thursday, November 19th, the board will meet for a study session at 6 p.m. Thursday, December 10th, we will meet for our regular business meeting at 6 p.m. Thursday, January 14th, 6 p.m. for our regular business meeting. Thursday, January 21st, we'll meet for a study session. And then Thursday, January 28th, we will meet at 6 p.m. for our regular business meeting. Again, members of the public who are still hanging with us who want to um, contribute public comment in future, please check the agenda for instructions on how to do that. Um, and, and just again, for the public, we try to post the agendas or notice them at least a week ahead of time. So please um, do um, continue to engage with us. Let us know how things are going from your perspective and how we might work together to improve them. So with that, um, if there are no further comments, we will move to item 17 and I will adjourn us. Good night, everyone. <laughs>